there were bands we were pretty close with that, you know, we found out that they would be like, oh, yeah, what are they going to do with this show and that show? They fucking suck. The bigger we get, the, the definitely the more shit talking. It's almost like the more popular you get, the more hated you get. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000 punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Before we start, if you want to support the podcast for a dollar a month, just go over to my Patreon. It's patreon.com slash thiswasthescene, and you can click the support button or the, the whatever the fuck the button is for a dollar a month, and uh, that helps keep this going. Thank you to every single person out there who has supported the podcast through the Patreon, buying things and donating money. You've kept us alive, and it's really awesome, so thank you very much. Kill Your Idols was an American hardcore band from New York, active from 95 through 97, and were signed to Side One Dummy. The band released many 7-inch EPs, splits with other bands, including Full Speed Ahead, Fisticuffs, Voorhees, Good Riddance, and Poison Idea, compilation tracks, and full-length LPs in their 11-year run. Most of the records were released on vinyl as well as compact disc. They cite Poison Idea, Negative Approach, Sheer Terror, Agnostic Front, Minor Threat, Warzone, Sick of It All, and Seven Seconds as some of their influences. They were fast and had a loud, dirty, dual guitar sound with shouted vocals. They employed hints of melody in their song structure, and although they derive many of their influences from California and D.C. style hardcore, they were considered a New York hardcore band. I'm pretty stoked with this because I met Andy like one time, but he used to be pretty tight with Sean, who's my drummer in Lane Meyer. And uh, they used to just talk all the time about, I think, like relationships and shit back in the day. And so getting him on this is really cool to, to kind of talk about that a little bit and then hear the whole history of the band. And it's a really awesome story. And Andy is a fucking super nice guy. So I'm really excited that uh, this happened, even though he's not very technically savvy, as I was told by Gary and by Andy himself. But we finally made it happen through the Skype. And this is what we chat about. Starting off as a deadhead, was he a songwriter prior to starting the band? Who started getting their tattoos? What does he think about playing Long Island? Playing every small town that they could across the U.S.? Dealing with depression? Always writing a ton of songs? What are his thoughts on their new songs? Their last show when they broke up? The Webster Hall show? And a ton more. Lastly, if you want to support the podcast, also you could just go check out my animation company. It's drive80.com where I do explainer animations, logo animations, Instagram stickers, and app and software demos. The Instagram stickers are great for realtors and small B2C businesses who want to brand your Instagram stories and things like that. Again, go check it out, drive80.com, drive 80com And if you want to follow my daily comic, it's Your Daily Bread on Instagram, B-R-E-D. And um, cool. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some punk rock nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. My connection with Lima was a bad breakup I went through. That's how I met Sean and got completely obsessed with the record and sean used to tell me he'd be like yeah man me and andy like talked for hours last night on the phone or where however yeah. you guys communicated i thought that was the greatest thing he's like he's like dude it's so rare this guy from this band it's like this hardcore band is the nicest guy and we're talking about you know relationships and stuff and he enjoys the record i was like that's crazy i thought it was dude, awesome. i didn't just enjoy the record the record was might be a little dramatic to say life-saving but uh, I think it was the second record, actually. The first one was more upbeat. Yeah. But the second one, don't I remember him saying, that singer or the guy who wrote that, you guys didn't get along with, maybe? Well, he was, my, he was, he still is a really good friend of mine. We were best friends growing up. So we started the band, and we were a different band, and then we changed our name. Well, we got Sean and this guy, Alan, in the band, and then we changed the name to Landmire. So around that time, we recorded that second record, it was like me and him were just kind of having a, a rift and then him and Sean didn't really get along back then. So about pretty soon after we recorded it, um, we ended up, he ended up uh, quitting the band. So then I took over as lead singer, but he wrote the majority of the songs in that record. And I wrote about three of them. Like I love the first record. Uh, our friends from uh, Hagerstown, Maryland turned us on to you guys which we could discuss that. I just don't want to really discuss how much heartache I was going through, and that's what really my relationship was with the second record. But that that last song on there, and 
the song my very own Winnie Cooper still like choked me up a little bit. That's to this day. crazy. I mean, those really that guy's lyrics were just beyond amazing for especially what I was going through at the time. And I think Sean was going through a rough time too. Yeah. And that's yeah. kind of, you know, it started with me writing to him. I think his name was the contact on the Lane Meyer record. That's how I yeah. ended up speaking with him specifically. Wait, so, and we don't have to talk about Lamar the whole time, but I just, I, I just really enjoy this because when he told me that you guys started talking, I was like, wait a minute. I was like, the singer from Kill Your Idols contacted you because he liked our record. He's like, yeah, I was like, this is blowing my mind. <laughs> I didn't like it. I loved it. I loved the first record too, but the second one, I'm telling you, I used to just play it over and over all night. Sitting on the internet, you know, looking at whatever I was looking at at the time. I think it was like punk chat or the old music hardcore news group or something like that. That's wild. And just listening to it over and over and over, like completely got hooked on pills. It was just, it was a crazy time and it all fit together. And the Lane My Record was like the soundtrack to my life at that point. Wow. That's awesome, man. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's a great record. Cool. It really, you know, I don't mean for this to sound like disrespectful. I don't know how big you guys actually were, but you should have been much bigger than whatever you were. <laughs> wow, thanks, man. That's really awesome. That's really fucking cool to hear. We, yeah, we 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 didn't really get that far. Um, Actually, what's funny is that um, we've talked to this a bunch of times. So a, a band that became label mates with you guys, so I mean, basically was uh, Gaslight. So Brian from Gaslight was in our band at the end. And then he did Gaslight Anthem, which was on Psy One Dummy, which is the label that... Did you guys end on Psy One Dummy when you, before you broke up? Or when you broke up? Yeah, that was another kind of interesting story where we ended up going with Psy One Dummy and it was not a good fit. They're an amazing label, but our band and them were at opposite ends of the hardcore spectrum. Like they wanted to send us on these giant tours and the warp tour. And we were like, we want to play basements with bands that no one's ever heard of. So we wanted to take out bands smaller than us. And they wanted to send us out with Andrew WK and some 41 or 31 or whatever. <laughs> and to do the warp tour and stuff. And that that's just wrong wasn't where we were at, especially it was kind of the end of our touring career. So we weren't looking, it's just a different, we've toured with all kinds of bands. It just wasn't where we were at musically. Like we went on tour with bands like Good Riddance and Anti-Flag, like the bigger punk and hardcore bands. And it's like, it's almost like you're the opening band at a concert. Whereas when you go to like a smaller hardcore show, people go to see all the bands. It's not like you're the opening band and it's a bunch of like, like I would read the reviews and it's all like these little girls talking about who's cute in the band and stuff. And I was like, this is not our scene. Even we put out a split with Good Riddance and they sent it out to all these like glossy so-called punk magazines. I remember a lot of the reviews were putting us down and praising Good Riddance. And I could take bad reviews. I mean, we were around a long time, but they're, the things they would say about us were like, the singer sounds like he never even had a vocal lesson. And I'm like, what does that have to do with punk or hardcore? I mean, it's just a different world than the hardcore that we were into. You know, it's just hardcore got so big. And so I'd one kind of didn't know what to do with us. You know, the people that they catered to were not used to bands like us. Do they, I mean, I usually jump, I usually jump back and kind of lead up to this, but I want to stay here for a minute and then go back. So when, kind of want to dip in this for a second. So, I mean, they obviously assign you guys, I'm guessing they were fans of you guys just as a, on a music level, not for they, you know, some labels I think would look at the numbers of a band's previous record and kind of would go by that to sign them thinking like, okay, this is going to, we're going to be able to carry that and then they're going to bring in some money. But I have a feeling that they sign you guys. Like, based on you guys being around and having a lot of releases, but also we're fans of you guys, right? Well, yeah. I First of all, I want to stress that even though we were kind of at different ends business-wise, they were an amazing label. I mean, they did more for us than every other label we all combined. And we were on a lot of labels that really, you know, worked hard for us. Like, it was a whole other level. They bought us a van 
you know, one of the big points of us signing with them was because we were on the road like seven, eight months a year at that point. And, you know, what label doesn't like that? Yeah, they were the coolest guys, and it was not numbers, because when they came to see us, they flew out. We played a record store in Las Vegas to about 20 kids, and that was the night that, like, I think we kind of agreed to sign. It was not the numbers. It was the fact they saw us a few places. I mean, they came to New York and saw us play a sold-out show at ABC No Rio, which is still not a big venue. It's a little abandoned building, you know, a room in an abandoned building. But they saw us play some bigger shows, but... The night they decided to sign us, it was like 20 kids in a record store in Las Vegas. Half the crowd was out in the park, but they were just really behind us. And, and at that point, it was things were pretty exciting. Hold on, the cat's attacking me. Um, <laughs> it was pretty exciting because there was a bunch of labels trying to get us. And, you know, I learned a lot about how much business, of course, definitely not just, like, it's outgrown just kids doing it for kids and not that we're kids anymore or even that we were at that age but like the whole diy thing is not there's a whole business end to it and it's just like i said i'm i'm not gonna say we were in a bidding war but there was a lot of labels i mean some really pretty big labels trying to get us we even heard from a major label at one point we don't know if it was real or it was like some guy trying to troll us because the email address was a little weird I don't remember what label. It might have been like Warner Brothers, but it was like, why wasn't his email a Warner Brothers email? I mean, it was like a Hotmail account or something like that. But either way, we were like, we're definitely not interested in going that route. I mean, we knew who we were, you know, but the bigger labels, you have to, it's sad to say because it's hardcore, but most of those bands, you have to be like, you have to appeal to, to a certain crowd. And we were a bunch of like, old out of shape guys that was not going to appeal to the crowd that they were looking for well how old how old were you guys back then because that was 2001 when you got signed by them right um that's what wikipedia tells me anyway yeah it was around there i mean it's hard for me to narrow down the specific years but in 2001 how old was i i, I don't know i mean I, i'm 54 now so it's funny that you just say like old hardcore guys. You guys are like 23, 24, and you're really not. well. I was in my I was in my thirties. I can remember when I was twenty four, feeling old. I remember someone said to me, "I'll never forget this." I was at a film, and someone was like, "You're two dozen years old," and I felt so old, twenty four. <laughs> <laughs> but thirty four in hardcore years is pretty old. I mean, you got to remember also, hardcore didn't come around until the eighties, so. It was all young people. Now there's plenty of older people because hardcore has grown and people have grown with it. But it's, it's definitely a younger person scene. The young people are the ones who make the rules and keep it relevant and stuff like that. Yeah. Well, let's let's go back to the beginning when you got involved in the scene. We'll work back up to this to kind of give people like a, a little bit of a glimpse of what happened. So I want to jump back into how you personally got involved in the scene when you were younger before. And then was it the band that got you into it or were you into it? And then you started the band. No, the band didn't come till years later. I got into it. I was a complete deadhead with a giant Afro. I used to work for a few months and then go on tour with the grateful dead, with my friends traveling around the, the whole East coast and the Midwest and, selling trinkets and stuff out in the parking lots and tripping my face off every night and just living like this really carefree, happy lifestyle. And I just grew. I, I, first of all, I started, I don't know, as I got older, I hated the disconnection with the band. I'm like, my whole life revolves around this band. I've never met them. They don't talk on stage. I really don't know what they're about. And the crowd started to get really lame, too. It started to get, in the mid-80s, mid to late 80s with the dead, the, the crowd started to become really full of, like, frat boys. Fights were breaking out. You never saw a fight at a Grateful Dead show. You know, guys grabbing, like, girls and stuff like that. Just It just got started to get really ugly. A lot of undercover cops started coming around, and ticket prices went up. I, you know, at that point, I think it was, like, $30. But I remember being like, this is an outrage. And, th and then the thing that really killed me was security was accused of killing a kid at a show in New Jersey. And the dead went back and played there again. And that's when I was like, I can't see myself supporting this band anymore. But while this was happening, at the end of my dead days, 
a friend of mine that just knew I was like an open-minded guy that loved music gave me the angry Samoans inside my brain and the descendants, Milo goes to college. He just gave them to me out of the blue. He said, here, try this. You might like it. And at that point, I had never seen, I had Ramones and Clash records, but I had never seen anything like the angry Samoans or the descendants. Like, even just the fact that they were on, like, I remember uh, the angry Samoans was on Bad Trip Records. And I remember just being like, well, what is this? And like looking at the picture of them, and they were like, these four somewhat normal looking guys, but the music, you know, the mo- I just never heard anything like that. And I would put it on to kind of shock my friends. And the thing with the Descendants, I was a young kid, you know, falling in love every three weeks. And, and, and you know, the, the Descendants have all these pop. They, they weren't poppy at the time compared to hardcore that, you know, now they might seem poppy. But at the time, it was like raging music. And it was just much more personal than any of the big rock and roll I was into. So I was definitely drawn to it. But I didn't know there was a whole world and a whole scene out there of this kind of music you know i just had these two records and i played them and so i started to go see some bigger punk bands like uh, gbh and the exploited and stuff like that and usually when they would play in new york uh, like some of the local new york hardcore bands would open for them like i think war zone and uh, sheer terror played some of the Bigger shows, in, and I was at a big show at the Ritz, and someone handed me a flyer, and it just said like "hardcore show" on it at CBGBs, and it was like Bold and Gorilla Biscuits, who I had never heard. Oh, wow. That meant nothing to me, but at the time, I was so into like I remember whenever I would go, I would go see two or three of these big punk shows a year, and I would get this feeling in me how great it was. But then it would kind of fade because, again, I didn't know about the scene. I remember looking at all the people at these shows and being like, where do these people go between these concerts? Like, where are all these people? I was from Long Island. There was a very small group of hardcore or punk people on the island. They, they were probably around, but I didn't notice them because I was living a different lifestyle. But so I said, it's, screw it, right? It says hardcore show. I'm going to go check this out. And I went to CB and it was Gorilla Biscuits and Bold and that's when I kind of caught on you know there were tons of flyers for other shows and I realized that CB Beavis had shows at that time uh, almost every Sunday you know, it was kind of the tail end of the big matinees there was a lot of violence then so they were kind of getting shut down so it was more of a trial thing they weren't doing them every Sunday anymore I think it was like one Sunday a month but I could be wrong about that but yeah, that's when I realized like there was a whole scene, and that, that happened right around that time when I was getting fed up with the dead scene, and I just, I don't know, it was like this this was the perfect replacement. It was like a whole scene based around the music. You know, people hate the dead and the punk scene, but the ideals are very similar. The things that grabbed me about hardcore, first of all, it was the band crowd connection. Yeah, because that t- totally turned me off about the big bands that I loved. I mean, I was a huge Neil Young fan, also. I still am, but I remember waiting almost like four hours one time outside his dressing room, and he just didn't bother to come out. Twenty fans, he could have like signed some autographs and made everyone happy, and he just didn't come out. Those were the things that were bumming me out about like the big stuff. And then here I am at CBDBs and Gorilla Biscuit show up. They just walk down the block with their guitar strapped on their back. They're in the pit, you know, slam dancing while the other bands are playing. And all that stuff just, it just blew me away. Like, I couldn't believe this thing existed. I remember always telling, like, other people, like, it's the most well, it's like the best uh, kept secret that I've ever discovered. In my mind, I was like, anyone who finds this is going to love it. But I brought, like, friends of mine that were deadheads or just classic rock guys there. And they, every one of them hated it. I mean, they were like, what the fuck? I mean, the best, the most they got out of it were like, you know, you could push people around and they don't care. And I'm like, I think you're missing the point. <laughs> so for a few years, I went to shows all by myself. Once in a while, a couple of Dead Ed guys I knew were into punk before. Like, they went, like, I went from the dead to punk. They went from punk to the dead. They were like, they were like around for like the first hardcore like they saw all the original dc and la and new york bands uh, occasionally i could get one of them to go see 
you know, a, a show. But other than that, I, I went alone, which really just made me more into it because I would watch every band. You know, I didn't know any of the rumors or gossip and who lost the edge and who was signing to a label they shouldn't and any of that. I just watched every band. I every I bought seven inches from like every band that I could and they read every lyric. I read any literature that they gave for them. I mean, I saw this band Anti-Schism at ABC No Rio. They had a bunch of PETA stuff with them. Uh, I mean, literally, I read that stuff. I didn't eat meat for 20 years, like from that night. I mean, it was like just it just blew me away, the whole thing. And I was so into it. And CBs had kind of, again, that, it was the tail end of CB. What I was doing was I was going to ABC No Rio every Saturday. But every other show, anywhere in the city that there was a show, I went to. It didn't matter what night of the week it was. didn't matter day, night, who was playing. None of that mattered. Like, I was a sponge just absorbing everything. And it was it was a great time in my life, really. What kind of a... In, in like, when a band was playing, what kind of person were you? Were you standing in the back, or were you, like, in the crowd jumping around, like... Oh, no, I loved... I loved like slam dancing and jumping around and having a great time. I never did like the tough guy thing, like, but uh, wait, what was that? I mean, what was the tough guy thing again? Just like you know, I just I don't know any of these catchy dances or anything. I, I mean, it was really just like running around in field and circle pitting and stuff like that. That that that's more what I was into than like the full on mosh. Who's the band then where you were like, I have to go and see them all? Like your favorite fucking band at that at that time? There, I, I didn't have them. I mean, Just I used to see, yeah, I used to see Born Against, Citizens Arrest constantly. Uh, you know, these all these bands, Rorschach, they would play ABC No Rio like almost monthly. But uh, Cringer, I remember, had a huge impact on me when they came through. They were a band from, I think, Berkeley. Uh, Citizen Fish came Poison Idea played there. They were they were one of my favorites. Uh, I can't even tell you. It was just ABC was a very important place in the early '90s in New York because again everything else was shut down. If bands wanted to play in New York City, nine out of ten times that's where they played. But ABC No Rio was not CBGBs. A lot of kids didn't go there because they thought it was too artsy and this and that. You know, you, they had very strict kind of guidelines you know they didn't allow any racist sexist or homophobic bands there which in my mind that should be a given but but believe it or not there there were plenty of bands that couldn't play there so but i mean that was the to me that was the place to be I, I, again it's funny you know when you talk about it you go blank but there was just oh i saw a jawbreaker there i think twice it was just the sick place they were another huge band that had a huge impact on. they were one of my favorites when I was going through that thing with Lane Meyer, or oh, Dear You from Jawbreaker was the other rep. That's crazy. That's so crazy. Well, it sounds like you were, were you pretty, like a pretty hopeless romantic guy, like growing up? Was was that like your... No, not really. I was just your typical suburban guy, like, you know. Uh, I think I'm a pretty emotional guy, though, but... You know, I, I guess I just, I, I lived a lot of things that could have been like an 80s movie. You know, my friend cheating with my girlfriend, getting caught, you know, my friend's girlfriend, my girlfriend's mom calling me up and telling me that she was cheating on me. Oh, you know, I've lived some, through some pretty crazy stuff, and uh, I took some of them pretty hard back then. How did that transfer over? Because you, so I'm just like putting all the pieces together and how this leads to you singing and you know and, and starting the band. Like when you're at the shows and you're you're going through all the stuff in your life and you're also at the shows and you're finding this new connection with this crowd that you were basically like looking for and not realizing you're looking for it. At what point did you start thinking like I want to be up there singing back at someone like myself? Well, what happened was I, I see hardcore years like. You go to shows two or three years, and you're an old man in hardcore. Like I said, I there were periods of time where I'd go to three shows a week. Within two or three years, uh, I felt like I had been in the scene 20 years already. So I, there was a period of time where I kind of slowed down. I kind of started to take like the nine to five. I was I was a printer, and my job was I was doing really good at my job, and I just started to focus more on that. I, I just started to get burnt out. On the scene, I remember again. I was going alone, 
for a period of time. By this point, I had friends that I was going with. I, I, I met some good friends, but some of them were forming bands and they were kind of moving on to other stuff. So I slowed down and then I, I realized that like right near my house on Long Island, my apartment that I was living in, a new venue had opened, a, a venue that a, a bunch of kids rented a warehouse and started booking shows there. So I said, oh, you know, it's right by my house, you know, let me, let me go and see what's going on. And I went there and there were, Long Island had developed when I stopped going to shows on a regular basis, Long Island had about 30, maybe between 30 and 50 regulars, you know, that you'd see at every show. At a big show, you know, when the bigger bands came around, yeah, there were a couple of hundred kids. But in the small venues, it would be the same 30 to 50. I mean, I remember going to a show my friend set up, who did a lot for the Long Island scene, this guy Tyler who was like my first hardcore friend. I mean, he, he brought so many shows and went through so much. Sometimes, like, almost no one would show up. One time, I'm not going to name the band, but a band wouldn't even play because there wasn't enough people there for them to meet their guarantee. Like, Long Island was very small. Bands didn't care about playing Long Island. They, they played Manhattan. So I kind of slowed down. Then when I came back, all of a sudden, there was this big division between punk and hardcore. Like when I was doing the whole ABC thing and going to all the other shows in the city, and you know, I, I love all the New York hardcore bands. Some of them are some of my favorite bands, but I still love punk rock. You know, straight up, spiky hair, mohawk, leather jacket, punk rock. Like I, I still love that to this day, and I always did. You know, just because I got into like straight edge bands and and have some heavier stuff, all my favorite stuff is still punk oriented like i never went for the slower more metallic type stuff so i started to come around and the long island scene was very it had its own sound which was more much more like emo which you know that term now is like another thing that has just been completely commercialized and has nothing to do with the origins but there was a time where Emo was just emotional hardcore, and it was a kind of hardcore that was a little softer than your basic stuff. You kind of stripped the, a lot of the punk away from it and all. So I remember being like, what is this? You know, I, I mean, I'll admit it. I was kind of like, this is wimpy stuff. I met up with a couple, um, a good friend of mine who was in a, a New York band called Situated Chaos. He introduced me to Gary. And we had talked about trying, this is when I first really started to kind of want to do a band. And like show kids, that was another thing. If you called the band at that time, if you said, oh man, you guys are punk, it was like an insult. Like hardcore and punk had become so separate that like hardcore bands didn't even want to be like under the punk label. So we kind of just, you know, again, we were already somewhat older. I was only still in my like mid 20s. But we started talking about, you know, we got to do a band and like bring punk back into it and, you know, the old sound and, you know, all the bands that we grew up loving and stuff. And really, that that's kind of how it started. Were you like writing songs or lyrics prior to this or did you just start doing that wow. as soon as you started the oh. band? No, I never wrote a song in my life. I never wrote a poem. I never wrote a song. So when you first get together and you're like, all right, guys, like, well, let's do this and you're in you put on the task of writing the lyrics, like, were, was it easy for you? You know, it's funny. The, the first two songs I wrote, one is called Dread, and it's just like kind of song about, uh, you know, kind of, I guess, depression, and which became a big theme in Kill Your Idols. And the other one is about, like, child labor and companies exploiting it. So it's like two total different ends of the spectrum. But both of them, I wrote right away. Like, like I, I met Gary, and we talked about doing a band and he was like, well, you got know, if you want to be the singer, you got to have some lyrics. And we talked about getting together, but I, you know, I wrote these two songs instantly. And then it just, we got together and he played the music and I, I couldn't believe it. Like I was like, holy cow, he took these lyrics that I wrote and put them to music. And in my mind, and in a lot of people's minds, like Gary has a great reputation. He's an amazing songwriter. And he's an amazing guitarist. So he came with these catchy songs, and I just couldn't believe that, like, that's what he turned my lyrics in. 
who did you pull from like vocally where when you started singing because you got to find your voice right i mean the, the moment you start singing for the first time on a mic you're, you're learning it to your like you're teaching yourself like oh this is what i sound like and were you did you just naturally go with okay this is what i sound like or were you pulling from a style from another singer singers that you'd see all the time and say like let me just kind of mimic them a little bit before i find out what my voice is going to be you know, I guess it's no. You know, no one ever asked me this question in all these years. But I guess the obvious one would be John from Negative Approach, who were a huge influence, especially early with Kill Your Idols, and uh, Choke from Slapshot. And it's funny because the way I sang, I got from them. But I remember the way I would stand when we sang and and hold the mic and everything was the singer Jeff from Breakdown, which is one of my favorite New York hardcore bands. Yeah, it, it all started there. I remember Gary being like, you know, you got to think of like, you know, when you're up there on stage, you got to think of like what your favorite guys do. Like, So I kind of tried to mimic what the guy from Breakdown did, the way he held the mic and the way, he, just the way his mannerisms were on stage. And, and But singing wise, it was like, Choke and John from Slapshot and a negative approach, definitely, you know, a hundred percent. So I mean, that's also super. I mean, that's it's pretty scary for a stand up standalone singer when you have no instrument to hide behind. So like you're going from being in the crowd all these years, and now you're fronting a band, writing songs for the first time. You're not writing anything prior to this, and now you're. It's like you've got thrown into the fire super fast. You got to learn this shit on the fly, and now you're standing in front of people with just a mic. That's pretty scary like were you nervous at all when you started doing that oh i'm still nervous they're still to this day there are times that my eyes are closed more than they're open on stage and or every time the band stops playing first of all i loved our band from the first from our first practice like i was never one of those guys who's like like i've met people and they're like yeah i'm in some shitty punk band i, I was i never called our band shit i loved our band from the beginning we always took it as serious as we could. We knew we were never going to be millionaires or rock stars. It doesn't mean you don't do your best. Everything I, I try to do in life, I, I try to do my best. Like, you know, whether it's work, whatever, being a, a husband, uh, whatever I do, I try to do it my best. And that's the way I did Kill Your Idols. So when I was up there on stage for our first, I don't know, maybe, maybe our first few years even, I was totally confident when we were playing and I was singing because I, I'm, in my mind, I'm like, man, we are good. So I was confident. But soon as they would stop to have to tune their instruments or whatever, I would turn around and face the drummer. I really didn't know how to handle that. It wasn't until a little while later that I really started thinking of what drew me into punk and, you know, the bands talking between songs. That was a big part of one of the things that connected me in those early days when I said I used to absorb everything. The band's talking and what they were about, and that started to become more important to me. There was a, a period of time after I was, we were more comfortable in a Sabbath that it was very important to me, no matter how uncomfortable I was, to talk between songs, to talk about what the songs were about, talk about what the band was about, what we believed punk and hardcore was about. This, you know, We were a very scene-oriented band. We were very much, and we used to say at shows, you know, if you look around and you don't see members of, of bands here, those bands don't deserve your support. Like, that's what this scene is about. If, if we're not playing a show, you can bet at least two or three of us are at that show, if it's local. You know, anywhere in Manhattan or Long Island, a few members of Kill Your Idols would be at. I have always thought about you guys. Anytime anyone talks about you guys, there's this huge love for your band. And there's, you know, even on your Instagram, there's thousands of, you know, there's a shit ton of people with your tattoos, with the with the logo like tattooed on their, on their arms or wherever in their body. And I'm kind of guessing. Well, let me throw on you. Like, do you think that because you guys were so involved that, and in what you were saying on stage, and you're educating people like what the song's about, what your morals are about. You guys are saying that, like, hey, the other, that band that played isn't in the crowd. Like, you know, they're not part of this. And then you'll see us in the crowd. Or, like, you would just show up and people would see that. Do you think that would add it to such a strong connection to your band? Definitely. Not only that, but I think we singled out, like, 
I used to say on stage, I used to be like, this band is here for all the nerds and the outcasts and the friendless people and the rejects and the queers and, you know, everyone else that feels they don't belong anywhere else. This is your home at a Kill Your Idol show. We won't let anything happen to you if we can help it. We wouldn't play while people, if people got in a fight, we stopped playing and we were like, you know, we would try to get them to break it up or at least single them out and try to make them feel foolish so they would stop. Also, you know, we, we just, again, we were very connected to the people that liked us. We, we hung out with them. You know, I remember, like, the first group of kids to like us along Long Island, there was this group, and they weren't the popular kids at that time. They grew to be. But at this time, they were just this young, dorky guys. And I know they wouldn't be offended, you know, when I say that, because that's <laughs> what they were. And they were just great guys. And they were, like, they were our first real fans. I mean, they traveled around the whole tri-state area. Some of them flew out to California once to see us, one of our first tours. And they that it started with this little group. They used to jokingly call themselves the South Door Brotherhood. But they were just this group of, of goofy kids. And, like, just a perfect example of the bond. One of them one time said, hey, is there any way you'd ever play in my backyard? And we were like, hell yeah. And we did. And those were the kind of things that sealed the bond. And they were the first ones to lead into it that got Kill Your Idols tattoos. Oh, wow. That's where it started. Who came up with that uh, that design, the skull? There was a, this guy, Mike Walter. He was in Sheer Terra and Luda Christ. Um, he was in Kill Your Idols for a fairly short period of time. But he's the one that came up with it. And it just stuck. We, didn't, we never knew it stick we were kind of just like we just thought it was kind of funny you know it was a skull but it was completely inoffensive and nothing like intimidating or like tough guy about it or anything like that there was just something it was cool yet goofy enough that we just really liked it and that it just you know people started getting it tattooed and it just it became our logo by default like our earliest stickers and shirts don't have that skull on it. It has, you know, it has other stuff on it. Well, you guys didn't even add that to your, your releases until No Gimmicks Needed, right? Or was was it added to any other artwork before that? Like for albums? Yeah, it, it's on our first. It's on the first record we did, but like on our, it's not on our demos or all the first runs of T-shirts that we made. By the time we made the first record, that was the first place it appeared. It was the cover of the first record, and it was like an insert that came with the record that had like a bunch of little skulls drawn all over it. So when you guys were like behind the scenes and going to shows and things like that, or, or like going to your shows, was there a conversation that you were having inside the band about the things you wanted to say on stage or the things that, you know, just the morals you guys had, or did that just come naturally without you guys having to talk about it as a, as a joint unit? For the most part, it came natural. Anyone that was ever in the band pretty much gave me free reign to talk on stage because they knew that I wouldn't misrepresent us, really. I mean, I can't say I really spoke for everyone about everything, but as far as, like, the punk ethics and stuff like that, anyone who was in the band pretty much shared them. I mean, that's that was a conversation before they would get in the band. But we never really, I never really said, I mean, there might have been some specific things here and there where I said, uh, tonight I want to talk about this. But it wasn't like I would run it past them. A lot of times I really didn't know what I was going to talk about. I would go on stage and again, some nights I was so nervous, I had to force myself to talk and I'd just be rambling about, you know, stuff that made no sense probably. <laughs> and like I said, I would just force myself to talk to try to let people know who we are. So I might have just explained why I wrote a particular song or something. How soon after you guys got together did you record uh, your first, like, you did an EP first? We did some comp tracks first. Then we did the the 12-inch EP. So what was the comps, like, which comps were you guys on? Prior to this, because I'm looking, I'm trying, basically like I'm just looking at. I got here like the four, four and three quarters CD, and above. Yeah, record. that that that's the first. That's that's the first. That's the CD of the first record we put out. It also came out on twelve inch. What like you know what led you guys on that path? You start you start the band up. Did you guys think when you started it where you're like, okay, we want we're starting this band because we love to play, but we also just want to do this. Like, this is our fucking thing that we want to do. So we're going to do all this stuff. Like, we're going to go on tour. We're going to record. Or did that just kind of, was it just like a step-by-step? No. 
at the beginning, it was like, hey, maybe one day they'll actually be like a pit when we play. The kids will actually like slam dance while we're playing. Maybe one day, like, we'll be able to do a seven inch blackout records, which was like, you know, a pretty well known New York hardcore label at that time. Our goals were like really small. We were like, oh, maybe we'll get to play with like H2O or something like that. Like, our goals were like easily accomplished for any band that really takes themselves seriously. We were never like, man, we got to tour the world or anything. The touring started because Gary was in Serpico, I think it was from Staten Island. And he went on a tour. And at that point, I don't remember which label made it, but someone made a sample tape. They took four songs off of that EP and Gary just gave them out. And while he was out there, it turned out he ran into tons of people that had already heard of us. Because when our demo came out, I mailed hundreds of them out all over the country. Every person that did a zine, any person that if they booked shows, even though I never thought we'd get there, I just... I mailed our demos. Back then, there were tons of zines. There really, there was no internet yet. That wasn't a thing. Cell phones weren't a thing. So I just, we used to, I remember, dub hundreds of tapes on my stereo. And wow. yeah, like one at a time. But one I tape in, dub it. And then, uh, like I said, we mailed hundreds out. We, we literally like covered the East Coast. Because at that point, we were like, oh, maybe we could travel like a couple of states down the East Coast or something. But when he went out with that sample tape, it turned out that like we had fans and he was like telling us about tour and we were like, oh, we got to do it. I, I, I truly don't remember what our first tour was. I, I can remember some of our first bigger tours, but I don't remember the first time we hit the road. But I know we were already with Blackout Records, which, again, was one of our big goals was to get with them. And uh, yeah. Toby, Toby from H2O. That was another thing. I was a huge H2O fan. I used to see them wherever they would play in the tri-state area, I'd go. I didn't know them. They didn't know me. Toby just got to know me from being a guy singing along up front every night. I gave him a demo probably 10 times before he listened to it. You know, every <laughs> kid in a band probably gave him their stuff. Yeah. Finally, something possessed him to listen to it, and he loved it. And at that point, H2O became a huge, huge part of Kill Your Idol's history. They got us, they took us on a U.S. tour, and they were pretty big at this time. It was us, Scarhead, and H2O. That was a, that was a crazy tour. Was that when H2O, like, I remember when they got signed, what was the label they got signed to that blew them up? And not, I mean, they were already big, but this Epitaph. put them in. But it was Epitaph, because I remember that, that record came out, and yeah, that was around 97, 98, because I'm looking, because around 98 is when you guys go on tour with them, right? 97, 98? Yes, that's when things started to blow up, because what happened was the computers came around, the printing industry completely imploded. I told you, I, I took my job very serious at that time. Computers came and just decimated the printing industry. Like, in Long Island, as a huge... Printing was a really big thing on Long Island. And I ended up getting laid off. So it was like, well, I'll be collecting unemployment for at least six months. So this gives us time. If we want to hit the road, now is a, a, a good chance. And that's how we started going out. And that was probably around, probably early 97, or late 96. Again, I'm kind of bad with dates. But once h 2 all got in the picture, they're the ones that hooked us up with Blackout. First of all, they gave us our first big show, which is one of their record release shows at a club called Tramps in New York, which is, you know, bigger than like CBGBs or anything like that. And I don't know, we went over great. That show, at that time, that show was like bigger than anything we ever expected. There were tons of people already knew our songs and they were singing along all the songs from the demo. I think the record came out at that show. So we had our record then. And we just went over really well. H2O ended up, again, taking us out on that big tour. And they hooked us up with Bill, who does Blackout Records. And he's the one who did just, this is just the beginning. There's a difference between playing a local show and having people go nuts. And then when you play New York City at a club and it's got a shit ton of people there and they're going nuts, like it's two different things. I mean, playing shows... First of all, I still get more nervous playing Long Island than any place else. Why? It's where I know everyone. A lot of my old friends that I know from years before hardcore come and 
see me and I want them to see, I want them always to see a good show, which at this point, you know, all of our shows are pretty good. But also, I know everyone, so there's a lot of heckling going on, you know, all in yeah. all in good fun and stuff yeah. like that. But it, it just again, I'm still always I'm a nervous wreck on stage, whether I appear to be or not. So I still always get nervous. I guess this goes a long island. I look out and I I know most of the people, but in the city, it's like I'm on stage in clubs that I went to for years. So it it, it was a different like the first times we played CBGBs. It was it was always a new milestone. Either we're playing with bands that I grew up loving or, you know, not grew up, but grew up in the hardcore scene. Or we were playing, you know, the first time we played CBGBs, I couldn't believe it. Then the first time we headlined there and sold it out, you know, it was another milestone for us. And just to be playing at a place that I had seen my first hardcore shows at and, you know, countless others through the years was a, a huge thing. Yeah, like playing in New York City... I mean, New York hardcore is world famous. You know, it's like it's like DC and LA in the early '80s. In the late '80s, it was New York hardcore. I mean, all over the world, we have countless people that got into us just because we were, a, you know, quote unquote New York hardcore band. So it sounds, yeah, it sounds like it never got away from because you're saying all these things. Like, you know, you start off following the the dead and you mentioned that you just felt this giant disconnect and then you just happened to trip over this hardcore scene which you felt so inclusive and you get involved and then you and gary get together and you're like hey man let's like start this band and you're like so our our goals were to get on blackout to have people sing along have people do a pit and go on h2o and i'm like just scanning on some of the information i have and all those things like came to fruition oh it, it's even more Crazy. than that the first conversation we had we had a three-way call. It was our original drummer, who's also like the honorary member of the band. His name's Ron. He's, you know, just a very close friend. He's written some of the songs with me. The first time we spoke on the phone about the band, we mentioned Poison Idea, Seven Seconds, this band from England called Voorhees. Through the years, we ended up doing splits with all these bands. We have a split with Poison Idea. We have a split with Seven Seconds. We have a split with Voorhees. We, and we also ended up touring. When Poison Idea came to the East Coast for the first time in years, their booking guy, we sent stuff to Jerry A., who's the singer. And I told you, Poison Idea was one of my favorites from long before Kill Your Idols. We sent that stuff to Jerry A. He called, they called us and said, we want Kill Your Idols on all of our East Coast shows. It's crazy. Yeah, I mean, it was like, and then Seven Seconds, who's like, you know, like huge. I mean, anyone into Seven Seconds can tell Gary, they're a huge influence on Gary. You know, the little melodic things he does and stuff. And we just love Seven Seconds. Again, they took us out on tour. I, I read an interview online where Kevin said we were like one of the best live bands he's played with. These things far exceed anything we ever could have hoped to do. I mean, we ended up, like I said, we, we you know we hope for a few people to sing along. Now it's like that that's part of a kill your idol show is everyone like singing along and, and going crazy and stuff. That's uh, when we broke up. I have a scrapbook full of stuff from the internet when we broke up and the, the stuff people were saying. I'm like, the funny thing is to bring it full circle. I'm like, our crowd are like deadheads. Like yeah. they follow us around. They're all friends with each other, and they all met at our shows, and they have a, this bond between them because, you know, where's the common bond? It's just, it was crazy reading all this stuff that was going on in the crowd that I never even knew about. And I considered us to be friends with all of our, you know, I, I hate to use the word fans, but all of our biggest fans, a lot of them we became friends with through the years. You know, if we saw a kid coming to see us all the time, we went out of our way to talk to him and say, hey, you know, we see you at all our those what's your name and give them a few stickers or a patch or even a record or whatever it's it's so funny to me because you guys are doing this and i'm just gonna jump forward for a second because this is around 2001 when you guys get on side one side one dummy and then that's when the whole scene just really starts to flip but you guys did it so well where i think that got so missed by so all these newer bands where they wanted to then have this giant separation and be on a stage and have the fans in front of them and just create this divide. And it's almost, I almost feel like it's something to really take away from that, that like bands like yourself that just 
go out of your way to, to connect. And that's what's going to, I mean, A, you have to write good songs and you also believed in the music you're writing. So you had the confidence of getting on stage and being like, I love these fucking songs. So I'm going to play them like I love them. And then I'm going to connect with people. So it just created this world. That's why I think people are so passionate for you guys, where I think a lot of bands, they missed out on that. And that's why they didn't have that strong connection with any of their fans. Well, I do believe that. I mean, we tour with some bands that sat in their van or sat in the backstage area right up until they played and then they were gone. You know, where, where, whereas we were out there, you know, sometimes we were even in the early days, we weren't above still being in the pit. And, you know what I mean? Having fun while the opening bands were play, or we were the opening bands while the headliners were playing and stuff like that. And we would stay with, you know, we wouldn't go to a hotel. We would stay with people from the scene that were willing to put us up and we would go and, you know, every town has its local place that everyone goes to eat after the shows. We would go and we would go to the local Denny's or whatever vegetarian hot spot there is. And we would go and hang out with all these people. I mean, we ended up having like good friends in uh, Kentucky, Radcliffe, Kentucky. That, that was the second group of kids that got Kill Your Idols tattoos. We got real close. And again, they would travel all over the Midwest to see us. We would stay with them. You know, whenever we were in that area of the country, we would stay with them for a few days. And Daytona Beach, Florida, down here, we had another a group that we just became super close with. And for all of our Florida dates, we would stay with them or we would drive down to Miami and play and then go back up to Daytona and stay with them. And uh, Southern California, this little town, Wilmington, we had a crew there that we just became super, like all over the country. We had these pockets of like super friends, you know, like, we we call them part of the, they were just beyond they weren't just fans that they were friends but not just them but everywhere we went Chicago you know we made friends we stayed with kids we went out and hung out with everyone after the shows and that is something at the time we didn't think of it like hey we're marketing ourselves like we just did what came natural you know we were like yo we're let's we're living this life let's love it this is what we love to do. Did you ever feel when you're on tour that you guys struggled or did you feel you kind of, I wouldn't say had it easy, but you, some bands went on a tour and it was really hard for, if they went out for a week or a month or however, however long it was, they, they would mostly in the beginning have shows where there'd be no one, like two people, it's the person who's, you know, the two people that promoted the show and that's it, or the other band that they just happened to be playing with or the bands played with, or like maybe 20 people and then randomly they'd have a big show. Did you guys feel like when you went on the road, you had the opposite of that going on, where it'd be, it wouldn't be, it would be less of the smaller shows and more of the bigger shows? Uh, no, not at first. You know, we we did it. Remember, we toured constantly. Like our friends from Kentucky, I remember one time, like we were seeing them four or five times a year. Like Jesus. that's it. You know, we were constantly out and. You know, we didn't go out for, like, we didn't count, like, a, a weekend as a tour. It had to be at least, like, a week. I mean, we would go out for a week, you know, do, do let's say, you know, the, the, the Northeast for a week. Come home, be home for two weeks, and then go out for a month and do the whole country. You know what I mean? Then come home, then go over to Europe for six weeks. Then come back and then do the East Coast uh, for two weeks or something like that. Like, Jesus but what happened was it started with, you know, look, I remember places playing, you know, and there were four kids there. Next time we went, there were 10 kids and then there were 30 kids and then 50. And then there were some places where, you know what, on our last tour, there were still four kids. There's some places where we just, we just never really went over, but we had kids that loved us enough that we still said, Hey, you know what? It's on our way. Let's stop and play. So what if it's not a big crowd? There's still kids there that love us. We would play for them. We met kids. We, we were driving from Sacramento to Denver, I think. Oh, or God. Salt Lake City. And we met, we stopped at this random Denny's in Elko, Nevada. It's like three three exits on the throughway, on the interstate or whatever. And there's these kids there in like these long black trench coats. And this was right after the Columbine shooting happened, I remember. We were like, oh, these guys look a little odd. And they came over to us and they were like, are you guys a band? And we said, yeah. And we told them who they were, who we were. It turns out a friend of ours from Long Island knew them and told them about us. And they were like, dude, there's tons of punks in our town. Next time you go on tour, 
is there any way you'd play here? And we were like, without that, especially break up that drive from Sacramento to Salt Lake. Like, you know what I mean? Like we used to play every little town we could. We went, we ended up playing this place out on Nevada. Every kid in town came. Didn't matter if they were punk. It was just something to do. I mean, by the third time we played there, they were practically having like ticker tape parades for us. I remember <laughs> we, we got off the highway, some mom with her kids in the car pulled over and was like, you kill your idol, follow me. And like, took us to the gig like it was it was just crazy <laughs> that's so fucking awesome <laughs> well we played all these little towns again like go all over like i said like radcliffe kentucky bend oregon Wil- wilmington california we didn't just go to the big city sometimes we even skipped over the big cities to play these little towns man they all have punk scenes but what's even better is you get a lot of kids that aren't even necessarily into punk they're just like wow something different to to do on a you know wednesday night or something like that did you like when you were doing those tiny shows did you you ever bring bands with you on tour and you're like all right so there's gonna be some stops that you're gonna be like where the hell are we but just wait and then you get there and you play these shows and kids are coming out of the woodwork and the other band is just like what the fuck is going on totally without a doubt look uh, we didn't invent that i'm sure we weren't the first band to play Elko, Nevada, but I think that it became a stop for a lot of bands after word got out what was going on there, you know, that there were not only tons of punks, but that just tons of people came out. I mean, again, you're breaking up a really infamously long drive and, you you know, again, it's another night to play. It's new kids to get into your music and uh, just a chance to meet more people. I mean, it was just... But yeah, sometimes bands who they didn't know where we were going. But usually the bands we took out trusted us. And what was like your favorite spot to like out of the, out of the whole country outside of New York? What was your favorite place to play? Well, definitely the Jersey Shore. I mean, the Jersey Shore accepted us before New York did. Really? Oh yeah, the Jersey Shore was Kill Your Idols' home. I was not expecting that. People on Long Island hated us at first. They really did not like us. I don't think they even liked us as people, never mind as a band. I mean, <laughs> really? we got no love other than that little crew of kids at first that I told you about, that those, those the South Shore Brotherhood, that they were like, there, it was them and a bunch of kids that grew up in the same town as me, that they were in a band also. We played a bunch of our early shows with. But yeah, Long Island, it, it, took, it took a while. And I'll tell you, one of the things that got kids on Long Island to love us was Long Island bands going on tour and all over the country meeting people that are like, you don't kill your idols? Yeah, they come through here all the time. They're great and this and that. And This might sound cocky, but some of the bands that we first became friends with definitely didn't like us, but we were kind of an in. You know what I mean? They could call up some promoter in Hagerstown, Maryland, and say, hey, we're friends with Kill Your Idols. We got this number. And the guy would go out of his way to make sure that they got a show. How'd you hear about that? What, that they didn't like us? No, how did you hear that they were doing that? Well, we just we just know. I mean, people, you know, we would, we would, again, we became friends with a lot of the people that booked us and stuff. And they would say, oh, this band called me and said they're friends with you. And in my mind, I'd be like, that's funny. They walk out of the building every time we play. <laughs> I wouldn't tell them that, though, because it's, right. it's just not my style. Do stuff like that. The same way now, I wouldn't name any names. Like, yeah, totally. Yeah. There was definitely bands. Again, this is not. We're not I'm talking. To turn this into a t- shit talking session. But you know, there were some bands that just would see an opportunity and use that. And you're like, oh, okay, I guess. Yeah, there were bands we were pretty close with that. You know, we found out that they would be like, oh yeah, why do they get this show and that show? They fucking suck. The bigger you get, uh, not that we were ever a huge band. But we definitely held our own for a while there. And the bigger we get, the, the definitely the more shit talking. It's almost like the more popular you get, the more hated you get. Well, I, I've talked about this in other episodes. I think just what happens with is with that people think that when they start a band and another band in the town is blowing up, that it's it's kind of their they're deserving of that same status. But there's just this magic. Either you catch it or you don't. And and then they see other bands catch that wave and move on. And they just think like, well, we're in the same scene. We have the same kind of crowd, I guess. And why are they blowing up? So they, they, I think that creates like that jealousy. It's kind of like, well, we deserve that. And you're like, well, sometimes just not going to happen for you. 
that's why our third record was called From Companionship to Competition, because that's really what happened is it went from, you know, I'm like I say, we were naive, but at first we would help anyone. You know how many bands like were going to come to New York and never played CBTVs and people all over the world dream of playing at CBTVs. Yeah. You know, it's where people say that's where punk was born and this and that and the other thing. Plus, you know, it was infamous for the matinees in the late 80s and stuff. We got bands from all over. We got shows there, you know, and we would, of course, play with them and stuff. And as we got more popular, it would help to make it a better show and stuff like that. So, yeah, but that's what happened anyway. It just it went from that and helping bands out to suddenly hearing bands complaining, oh, well, why did they get signed to that label? Oh, well, why did they get, you know, because we got a very good thing with Side One Down, you know, to bring it back to them. Like, one of the things that when we were looking for a label, whatever label we signed to had to get us a van. Our van had died. And again, a big part of Kill Your Idols is was our tour. Like, we were on the road, I told you, constantly. So that was a big a big part of whoever we were going to sign with. You know, people would definitely, you know, I, I know as a fact that there were other bands looking for to sign with labels that suddenly wanted a van as part of their thing. But the difference was we, look, bands tour all the time. And I'm not saying that we set the pace. Obviously, Black Flag is the one that started it all. And there were always bands that were on the road all the time and we would run into them. But when we started touring in the mid-90s, mid to late 90s, like 97 or so, bands were not touring year-round. In the summer, they would be packed during like when schools are on vacation. You know what I mean? Like you, there would be bands all over the place. You went on tour in the middle of winter. You were the only band, which made it easier to get shows because you would call these promoters and no, nothing was happening. So they had open days or whatever they were booking. And it, that's another thing. We were very lucky. I don't think in all the tours we did, which was more than I could count, I don't think we had more than five shows ever canceled. And I heard of bands going out on tour and like half the tour gets canceled. Like we never yeah. experienced that. And not only that, but I was very lucky because I booked probably 80% of our tours. We had, we had booking agents twice for short periods of time. Why was that? Why did you guys not keep with, stick with booking agents? We couldn't see eye to eye. Again, they were like, oh, we're going to get you a tour with this guy. And we were like, no, we want to take out this band and play, you know, basements and bagel stores. And they were like, we never, look, we played clubs, plenty of big clubs we played. And you know what? When we played them, we lived that life. We got a rider. We got a contract because that's what those clubs do. That's not what we insisted upon. When we were playing Little Joey's Basement, we didn't say, hey, we need a dressing room and clean towels. But if we were playing some club that gives that shit, of course we were going to ask for it. This club maker is going to walk away with a shit ton of money. What? We got in a huge brawl. Not not physically, but it got very ugly with a bunch of kids in Canada because a kid booked a club. At this point, we had a booking agent. And, you know, we had a rider that asked for, like, water. I mean, our rider was so simple. It wasn't like green M&Ms or anything like that. It was like, you know, give us some food, give us some water and juice, maybe some beers. Very simple shit. And these guys made it sound like we thought we were Van Halen or something. I mean, they ripped us apart and they, they were on a message board talking about it. Some kid was like, oh, we should piss in there, juice and this and that. And luckily somebody said, hey, do it. You know, I think you should see this. So they sent us a link to it and we saw it. And, you know, we called the kid out. Like, first of all, you agreed to it. If you had this much of a problem, why didn't you say, no, I don't do riders and we would have worked something out. There's no promoter out there that can ever say, oh, I tried to book Kill Your Idols, but they wanted too much, so it didn't work out. You know, they wanted for this and that. When we played a place that offered that kind of shit, we took that kind of shit. When we played a squat or a house or someone's backyard, or we played all kinds of places. We played libraries, bagel stores, broccoli patches. I mean, you name it, we played there. We didn't ask for shit like that. We didn't ask for anything. We didn't even ask for a pizza. There were times we didn't even ask for money. Give us whatever you can. Like, we were not that kind of band. But if it was a club... And they did riders and all that. Why the hell wouldn't you? It'd be stupid not to? Um, I forget where I was going. See, I go off on these tangents. No, I love it. No, it's perfect. Go off on tangents. That's like the podcast is all about just you talking. <laughs> it's just your story as well. I love that you guys did all those random spots because I think that's what helped 
you know, build the name of the band and get such love and connection to your band because you guys did stuff like that. And, but I'm looking at your member list and you guys want, you guys have a lot of members. Like were people, was a lot of burnout happening because you were touring so much? Definitely. I'm talking about all the good times. Once about the 2000s hit, a lot of things changed. I started to get really depressed. I was having some, I had some real demons in my life that the guys all had to deal with. And, you know, it wasn't two years later that I found out how much shit I had really put them through. You know, they really didn't have a choice but to deal with my struggles. And at the time, you know, again, I don't want to get too specific. I don't know who's going to listen to this. I'm sure people can put two and two together if they need to. But, you know, at the time, I looked at the problems I was having as only hurting myself. You don't really realize how hard you are to deal with and how, you know, the band starts to wonder, you, you know, Gary was just telling me recently, you know, there was a period of time where they would be on the way to pick me up and be like, you think he's going to be there? You know, maybe he's not going to even pick up the phone when we get there or come out. It, it must, it got very, and I was in a very dark place too. It's funny. I found an old tour journal recently and I was like, this is, this is miserable. Like, It was definitely a period of time, which I grew out of, and looking back, I regret it, where I was just miserable. To me, I did some of our best writing. That's when I became a huge Lane Meyer fan and Joe Breaker. My lyrics, my writing style changed. I I think I started to write much more personal songs at that time, and I was much, I just was not a happy person. I went on tour, and I still loved playing. But overall, I just was not happy, no matter where we were. So I was really dealing with depression and some really bad habits. And, uh, you know, things got kind of lame. And in hindsight, it must have been... uh, On top of that, we're constantly away from home. You know, you come home and suddenly a crowd of friends has new faces that you don't really know. It's not the easiest to keep relationships going when you're away that often. So it, it did take its toll. There were some people that, you know, wanted to move on, guys that wanted to start their careers. We also weren't young kids. It's not like, oh, I could take the next few years to just hit the road. Some of the guys were finishing college. They wanted to start their life and move forward. They had families and they, they were having kids. So, you know, there were people that moved on for reasons like that. They just couldn't handle the schedule. And Gary and me specifically – we're just like, no, it's full speed ahead. Yeah. This is what we did. Were you getting a little resentful of the band at that at any point? Because it seems like you were going through some shit, which, you know, I want to dive into, but did any of that was was related to you at all getting resentful of the band? No. I think they, the guys in the band might have got resentful of me. But no, the band for me was probably the one thing keeping me somewhat grounded and sane you know writing was very therapeutic and it was a big thing also to just know other people could relate to what you're going through you know again that bond with our fans i constantly you would get emails and stuff saying oh this song really helped me get through a tough time Uh, i have i have 12 scrapbooks just full of letters and reviews and pictures and like i said one scrapbook is just all the stuff we broke up but for years, I just got letters from kids. Uh, like, depression was a huge part of Kill Your Idol. You know, like, a lot of people, that's what they related to. Like, I remember talking to someone after we broke up, and they were like, there's two sets of Kill Your Idol fans. There's the people that just love to go to your shows and have fun, and they love your songs and music and the whole vibe. And then there's people that just relate to your depressing lyrics. Is there, like, a song that stands out to you that was very significant, like, very sp- specific to that time period where you were like you'll look back at it and be like damn i was in a pretty like dark place there's a there's a bunch but i I know that um which split was it it was either the Voorhees or the good ridden split have some songs that were a good representation of that time you know that i can look back and be like man really fucking yeah you know, i can remember where i was when i wrote the songs and everything and be like you know be like man i was fucking really miserable at that time is there any song you play like you kind of just like don't like playing because it was a, just such a shit time you know it's, it's funny that you bring that up that 
there are songs I feel a little funny singing nowadays. And it's not that I'm not depressed anymore because I wrote those songs when I was, so they're completely real and authentic. But I feel funny singing songs, certain love songs, when I'm married with, to the love of my life, and here I am on stage singing songs written about other people. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, I would never, my wife is my everything. Like, I would never want to disrespect her. So it, there's a weird thing. She's got to hear this stuff, too. And I'm sure that it bothers her. It would bother me if she was doing it. It's even a little tricky to talk about. Like, look, uh, you know, I'll be very blunt. I, I feel like I've had some, look, me and my wife didn't meet till we were in our late 40s. So obviously, and she, she's got children. So obviously, we, you know, we weren't two uh, virgins that had never experienced love or anything like that. But I'll tell you something. My wife brought something out in me that no woman ever in my life was able to. So I look at my wife on a different plane than every, anyone I've ever met in the past. Doesn't mean my other relationships weren't real or that, you know, I thought it was the be all end all at the time. After meeting her, they seem insignificant. It's just a weird thing to be talking about these old, you know, times and that, that were based around, you know, breaking breakups and stuff like that for her to hear like that's it's the one thing to, we we might know about each other's past but it's not like we sit and talk about it. right <laughs> yeah she's not like like you guys have you guys have you know something happened in the past but also when she's at a show and you're like singing and she's like well here you are just bring it yeah. up again luckily it's of... fast enough it's not like some slow song right. like, i loved you you know but <laughs> But, you know, it's not like we sit in bed at night either, like, oh, that was a really bad breakup. I was crushed at that time. There's no need to go down those roads. Yeah, I mean, just real quick, it's it's funny, too, because um, Chris, who wrote the Lamar songs, like, when he would, there are certain songs that he feels really uncomfortable singing now because it was just different people he was in love with back then. And he's married with kids, and he's like, I don't know if I want to sing this stuff. It's like, exactly. Yeah, I get See, it. That's the thing. Yeah. But that's what people want to hear. I can't cut out half of our set list, you know, at the same time. But yeah, it's 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 a weird thing, and it's something that you know definitely younger kids won't wouldn't relate to. But as you get older and you're married, then it, it's a whole different world suddenly. You know, I could so definitely I see that with Lane Meyer. I, oh, I mean, yeah, with Chris, either record. Yeah, yeah, it's uh. Yeah, yeah, he's definitely like, ooh, uh, I guess I'm going to do this. I'm like, come on, man. People love that song. Well, the lyrics are a lot clearer when you guys sing. At least me, you can't make out what I'm saying. So I took a, I took a note before when we were talking about you got, you were saying how you guys would play and you'd go out and talk to the fans. You'd jump in the crowd. There's two questions that popped up there. Um, one of them, and I'll, I'll do them separately, but one, you'd be watching a band, but you guys are playing, and you guys are playing after these bands, but you'd personally get in the pit. Was there ever a concern? It's just such a weird question, but was there ever a concern of you getting and doing that and being like, shit, how am I going to sing after this? No, no. Okay. Never. It was always like, I, I, I don't know. I just... You mean like I would get too tired? Or just well, like your voice would get voice. be shot before you get on stage. Was there, Were you ever like, oh, I got to be careful? Every, every tour was the same because of the way I sang. More than, I've kind of learned to, I'm making little quote signs with my hand, but I've kind of learned to sing a little differently than I did then. But every tour back then was the same. The first After the first night, my I would be totally hoarse, except when I sang. Like I, I could still scream good, but... My voice would be shot for like the first three or four days and then it would kind of clear up for the rest of the tour. But I, I never really had those problems for some reason. Yeah, it was just I kind of just thought of it because that was I, I, there was a concern I used to have where I'd be like, I think I'm going to lose my voice before this. But the other question. I have that now more. Oh, OK. Just because I'm older, I'm not in the practice well, do you still like? I mean, the last the last show that I see that's documented online. The I mean, there could be more, but you guys played a show because Hate Hey Five Six has a video of you guys playing um, in 2017. Have you guys played since then? Uh, I believe so. Yeah, we did. That was Tompkins Square Park. I yeah. Think. Yep. Yeah, I believe we've played. Uh, yeah, we played uh, on Long Island. 
with Gorilla Biscuits. Actually, we played that since I was married, so that had to be in the last couple of years. And I believe we also played a festival in Texas. Oh, and Belgium also. We oh, yeah, wow. we've done a couple of shows since then. So, like, when you guys are, do you guys still have the same routine when you go to a show? And like, do you show up and like, do you stand in the crowd and watch the bands play, or do you kind of have a different routine now? Uh, look, I hate to say it, but no, it's it's not the same as it was. You know, we'll, these are people usually, especially if it's in New York. Uh, and now that I don't live there, even more so. These are people that we've grown to know since, you know, we've been a band since 1995. These are people that, you know, some of these kids we literally have grown up before our eyes. I only have a few hours to see these people. A lot of times, like, I'll fly in Friday night, we play Saturday, and I fly home Sunday. Like, it's, I don't have much time. Not to mention my old closest friends that are still in New York that I, you know, if I can, it's like, all right, I'm going to go up there. I'll spend the night with, with Gary. And then maybe if I'm lucky, I could see like my best friend the next day and go out to lunch. And then I got the gig and, you know, some of my friends will go there and I try to see them and I try to see people that I know through the band, you know, for years. Sad to say, but I don't have that time to like, I try to give every band at least a little, try to watch them at least a little bit, because especially now when there's younger bands I never heard of, and I just want to give them that respect. I, I don't want to be like that older guy that just shows up and plays and leaves, you know, gets paid and, and leaves, especially because I don't know these younger bands, like which ones they might. When we played with Seven Seconds and Poison Idea and all these bands, like these were my hero. I remember we did a Seven Seconds cover and like Troy from Seven Seconds came out and sang the chorus with us. We did a slap shot cover one time and Choke sang it with us. Same with Breakdown. Like we've done all this stuff like that. And I don't want to be the guy that lets, you know, if some band before us playing and like we're their favorite band, I don't want to be like them to be like, oh, they kill your artist watches. Oh, no, they were like at the bar next door during the whole set. Well, I think it's different though because back in the day, you were, it was, you loved those bands, but you also, were, the scene was different. And that's the whole point of this podcast. There was just a different, community back then before it changed and dispersed and kind of evolved into like the, the early 2000s and on and it just kept changing and changing as it does but the pocket we were in that seems it makes more sense that you guys would want to be in the crowds because a you're on tour you're living this and the people that you were around were all connected to you now it's there's i mean it's a giant disconnect you're showing up you're loving to play the music but it's not the same it's funny because I am so disconnected to the scene that I look at it and look, I'm not familiar with how the, the scene is these days, but it does look very different. Like again, when I went to shows and when I played shows, most of the time kids went to see the bands that were playing. Whereas now it looks like kids are coming to see the band that they want to see. They're not coming to see, you know, I used to go to those shows like at ABC and be like, Oh shit, I'm getting to see four punk bands today for five bucks. Whereas now people are like, oh, I'm going to see Cody Rattles. Yeah, there's, there's some opening bands, but they're coming to see us or whatever band they're going to see. Like, I don't feel like there's that same scene oriented, you know, support. And I could be wrong. I think it depends. I think there's, I think there is, um, there's, there, there's always a scene and there's, I think there's, it's different and it, there definitely is an underground scene, but. I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of this. If I go see a band now, there's opening bands, and some of them, they start to suck. I'm like, oh, can we fucking speed it up? Like, I want to see the band that I want to see. And also, I'm afraid they're going to go on at 10 o'clock at night, and I don't want to be up that late because it's just oh, old me talking. I go through the same thing. Not only that, I think it's unavoidable to have been to the amount of shows I've been through as a guy in a band and as someone that went to shows for years before that to not be somewhat jaded like if someone's up there doing something totally new and different i'm like what is this but yet if they're playing you know quote unquote generic hardcore which is what i love then i'm like yeah seen this done that i might as well listen to the bands that i already know that play this yeah so it's yeah, like totally. it's it's hard it, it, it's you know i was telling someone recently like it, it's very hard to get into new music these days and, and i don't mean it's not that i'm like it's not intentional. It's not that I, it's just, I know so much that when I hear something new nine out of 10 times, I just, I'm not interested in it. And if it's something again, that 
I like, there's someone I already know that does it that I'm familiar with. Interesting. It, it's really, it's not a good way to be, really. You know, like, I've been passionate about music since I'm 12 years old, since, like, I first heard the Beach Boys. I mean, music has been, like, the dominating force in my life. Like, whatever lifestyle I was living, it was based around music. It kind of sucks that I've come to a, this point where new music really, I find it hard to, for it to hold my interest. And, like, even the bands I love, seeing them live it's like if they start to play for too long that's why like i, I don't like to play long sets because i don't like to watch them i start to get fidgety and it could be because again i have anxiety issues and this and that so it could be just standing any one place for that long i start to get antsy but e- e- like even my favorite band i don't want to watch them for an hour yeah that's yeah i totally get that some and there's the other question that popped up before was when you're saying that you were you were kind of just relates to what we're talking about now like watching bands back then and and having a different style than the other bands where you would go and talk to fans and you'd be in the the pit watching the band or going nuts were there any bands that took note from what you guys were doing and said because they toured with you or saw what you did that they started to mimic that and connect with their fans more you know it's funny you say that that's something that i've always wondered like, are there bands out there that, you know, when they're asked, like, oh, who are your influences? They say, kill your idols. I don't know. Like, I've never gotten that kind of feedback. Like, I've, I really haven't seen it. I, I hope that we've had an impact on people. Like, I definitely think, as far as touring, that we, we, we did when we were still doing it. I think that there's bands that saw what we were doing and were like, we should do that. Like, yeah, there is no reason to just tour in the summer. Why not tour all year round? You know, and especially when we would tell them, like, you know, it's easier to get shows, you know, in the middle of January when no one else is on the road. You know what I mean? Like all the clubs and venues and even the kids, you know, they're not booking anything. So they're like, oh, great. They're starved for a show. Especially in a lot of these little towns all across the country. You know, the big cities are always going to have stuff going on. But these little towns, it gets boring. So a band is willing to come through and play. And they're, they're thrilled to have it. But to get back to it, it's a huge thing. Like, I really hope that we did have that impact. That there's people out there that musically are influenced by us. And as far as, like, ideology about punk and hardcore and what we try to represent. And again, that's why it was important for me to talk on stage. I, I really hope that there's people out there that, that listened and, and, and we, that we had an impact on them. But I haven't really seen... It's funny, all the feedback that I've gotten for years, like I told you, all the emails, and stuff I've seen on message boards and all, like, I, I never really came across stuff where people gave us that kind of stuff. It just seems like someone or bands would have watched that potentially and said, oh, wow, these guys, that's how you, I mean, you guys were doing it genuinely. And obviously there's two things happening there. You're genuinely connecting, but there's also that there is a marketing approach where you can lead with that and saying, all right, guys, we need to market the band tonight. So make sure you talk to fans. And then it sounds like with you guys, you just naturally just went out there without having to have that conversation and just be like, we're just talking to fans. And it became that thing that the other bands were trying to do where they were like, oh, that's called marketing. You're like, no, that's just fucking us connecting. You should try it. You should try that shit. Yeah, but that's why so many labels, when we were looking to sign with a label, that's why so many were after us. And another thing we, we did is whenever we signed to like a label to do records, we also made sure that in our contract, we were still allowed to do smaller projects. All the times we were on labels putting out records, we have like, I don't know, at least 10 split EPs out that we did with other bands. You know, we did the big ones with Poison Idea and Seven Seconds of Voorhees, but there's a, there's a shitload of others, you know, that uh, of bands that might not be as well known, or maybe, you know, maybe they're more well known than us, whatever. But the point is that while we were doing records, we also have, you know, more than I could count off the top of my head, we have split records out. You know, we just always were trying to pump stuff out. But if you're a guy running a label, again, that's just more promotion. Some kid that does a label that's going to get so-called street cred, you know what I mean? Again, if you want to look at it in the 
the business end, they're like, oh, this kid, you know, that's connected to the scene that does a record label is going to put out two or three songs of them. That's just help promoting our record. Yeah, you guys have a ton of splits. You got Fisticuffs, Full Speed Ahead, Nerve Agents, Voorhees, Good Riddance, Crime and Stereo, Seven Seconds. What else you got here? Modern Life is War, Poison Idea. Damn. Yeah, you guys you guys were fucking writing machines. Yeah, there was a period of time. You know, it's funny because you had asked about writing. There was a period of time where, really, like, I, I can remember just pulling over to the side of the road and writing songs. Like, it would just pop into to my head. Like, I never sit down like, okay, we got to write. Every now and then I would with that guy Ron that I mentioned, my friend. We would be like, hey, let's write a song together. But we would usually have something in mind that we wanted to base it around. And the same with Gary. There were times where we definitely sat down to write, but the majority of our stuff is written because I would carry a pad and pen with me. And when something came to me, whether it was a line or a full song, I'd pull over or I'd stop working or whatever and just, and jot it down. And, uh, you know, I still try to do that with the notes on my cell phone. I'm like, oh yeah, maybe this could work. Are you still writing now? Yes. Because you guys are you guys disbanded in two thousand seven, like, and you've you played some shows, but it I doesn't seem anything online that you've put anything out as Kill Your Idols. Uh, we, we just recorded our first new stuff in uh, I believe fifteen years. Get the fuck out! We of just recorded that. two songs. What for? A, a, yeah, we're doing actually of all things, we're doing a split, um, a split EP. That's I had no idea. That's so wild that we we just connected for this. It's actually a, a, a band from Long Island called Rule Them All, and it's on Flat Spot Records. This is the first two songs we've recorded in 15 years, and we're talking about doing a, a full length. What brought all this up? We just feel like, you know what, we're playing. It's almost like, you know, it's funny. You play and everyone wants to hear the old stuff, but... We're in this weird mindset. Like, is it insulting to people to just keep playing the old stuff and and not offer anything new? This is my thing. Like, people are like, well, when when do you call it a day? And I'm like, you know, if people still want to hear us, for now at least, I'm still willing to do it. When one of us gets to the point where we're like, you know what, man, I just, you know, look, I still struggle with doing this sometimes because I'm my age. I'm like, you know, does a 50-something-year-old belong singing hardcore songs but you know what if people want to hear it and i still love doing it then why not yeah absolutely you know we wrote these two songs we're going to put it out and i'm kind of look if the interest is still there and people like this new stuff we're doing then we're gonna move forward and see if we could have it in us to do a full length like how does it feel like do you feel the songs that you guys did now do you feel like it's comparable to the old stuff? So when we wrote this stuff, they're in New York. I'm down here. They're sending me recordings of songs. I'm going to tell you this, the whole blunt truth of this. And I'm like really not 100% into this. And I'm thinking to myself, how do I break to these guys that I'm just not feeling this? You know, I'm listening to it on my phone and I'm like, you know, the last thing I want is there to be like a side note. Like, yeah, and at the end, I just wrote some shitty songs and ended up fading off into obscurity. Like, I, that's the last thing I want. So I'm kind of torn. Like, I don't know how I feel about this. But I have some lyrics that, like I said, I, you know, even though we weren't writing anything, if stuff came to me, I still wrote it down just because you never know. It's been a long time, and I'm a, I'm a much more happy and well-adjusted person I did my best writing when I was at my lowest. It's I find it very hard to write now. So the downside is it's hard to write. The good side is it's because I'm in a good place in life right now. So I was kind of not sure how I felt about this. I sent my lyrics to, to Gary and he kind of, he put them, he picked out two of the songs that they had him put them to. And again, I'm still, I'm still very in the middle of this. They're going to, they're like, all right, well, we'll they booked the flight and I went up to New York and I'm, you know, part of me has this knot in my stomach. Like, I feel like I'm like, I have to talk to Gary and like, I'm breaking up with a girlfriend. Like I have to try to tell this guy cause they're all completely psyched out of their minds. And I'm like, how do I tell this guy that I'm really not feeling this? And I'm like, let me record it and see what happens. 
let me tell you, we were halfway through the first song and I was like on cloud nine. I love these two new songs. They're as good. They, it sounds like they could be off of from companionship to competition. Uh, first of all, I didn't even think I had it in me to sing like that anymore. You know, the whole time I'm planning, well, how am I going to sing this? You know, like, do I, can I still get that vocal out of me? I'm so thrilled with how it came out. You know, again, I, I can't wait for people to hear it. They're, nobody can say, oh, God, what, what happened if I kill your idols? You literally, if I played you two songs off our last record and these two songs, you wouldn't be able to pick which is which. There's a really fast one, and there's a one that's a little more melodic, which is what we've always done on our record. The straight up fast ones, and there's the, the melodic ones. So I, I love the two new songs we did. Gary played me a bunch of music if we decide to move ahead from here. And I'm really psyched. I love, like our melodic stuff is my favorite stuff. Stuff that everyone, and I know it's what the people that follow us love, because yeah, it's what they sing along to the most. It's so funny, dude. When you were saying that whole what you, that whole story right now, or um, you're just telling about the new songs, I was literally listening to you saying it as if you were you were in the presently trying to tell them that you weren't into it, like not knowing you were leading into that they were recorded. I was like. Is he gonna want to let to? Is he gonna want me to put this out? Because I thought you were still like, I don't know how to tell Gary. I don't want to do this. I was like, I don't know if you're gonna want this to be out there. <laughs> but then you're like, No, I love the songs. I was like, Oh, okay, okay. I see where you were going with this. Uh, and I'm not just saying it. Anyone that's listening to this podcast that's a fan of the band, when they hear the two songs, I'm telling you, they're. If you like Kill Your Idols, you're gonna love. Them. If you don't, then whatever. You won't like them. But there's. They're straight up. They could have come out 15 years ago. You would not know the difference. And everything's there. Like I said, as soon as I got on that mic and it all came back to me and I had the headphones on and I like to record, I, I like the music cranked. Like I like to be surrounded by the music. Otherwise, I can't really cut loose and, and give all with the vocal. So I have these headphones on and they're cranked and I'm just, I'm totally in the moment. Total natural high, you know, like it was just really, I, I couldn't believe it. I was blown away. Like I came back and my wife was like, wow, what a difference. Yeah. Like it, it just, you know, it's funny because she's like, you know, you like this whenever you guys play a show too. It's like, I call it beforehand and I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe we're doing this. What am I doing? <laughs> like, I don't even know if anyone cares that we're playing. And then I call her afterwards like, it was great. <laughs> You know, there's that natural high that you get when you play. Yeah, man. It's at the core of you, though. You know, you got to let it out. It's You're afraid. I don't know why people get afraid of that. I mean, I think there is that fear because I think you know you're excited for it. And then you're kind of bu you're afraid that you're not going to be if no one else, if it's the magic doesn't happen. But it always seems to show up. Exactly. That's what it is. Like, the magic happened. Like, everything, I just couldn't believe it. Like, I was like, are these the same songs I've been listening to and not? completely like in love with like all of a sudden you know i guess again over your phone you can't hear everything i couldn't hear like you know i'm a big fan of gary's playing i love these little melodic things that he does in our songs and stuff but you couldn't really hear that when i played it on but when i heard it on a good recording it just sounded so i'm i just i'm telling you i'm thrilled with it like really as soon as we started it all just came back so let's go back to 2000, like the end of basically when the band breaks up and lead up to that. So you guys get on Cywin Dummy and the scene's completely changing. You guys are touring like fucking crazy. You're going, you know, you said you like had demons you're going through, you're, you're depressed, going through band member changes and stuff. And like, so you guys get signed in 2001, but Cywin Dummy. And then your last release is in 2007, which I think is the also year you broke up. So that's like six years of still just carrying all this shit for the whole time. So like, what was the thing that really started to, what were all the things that started weighing down on you besides like the personal stuff? Like was the changing scene, was that having an effect? Was Yes, without okay. a doubt, without a doubt. I can remember, first I want to add in that at the beginning of the 2000s, we definitely had, Gary had decided he was going to quit the band. He just wasn't feeling it for whatever reason. We got an offer to go to Japan. So we went to Japan. 
Gary fell head over heels back in love with the band. He came back and, and it was like full speed ahead. We went right back on the road and just became like completely full time, you know, band again, writing like mad and, and touring like mad. So things were good for a while for the band. For me personally, I was going through a lot of shit, but the band was still doing great. But it did start, I want to say about 2005. That's when things really started to get bad. That's when the scene really started to change. I can remember a lot of kids, they were coming to shows. It was like something to do before they went out to the dance club. Like I remember playing a place and like the show, and I'm sure you guys have encountered this. It's like, you got to get out by 11 o'clock because that's when the, it turns into like this crazy dance club. And I remember like, being at this place and like a lot of the kids there were like they were like yeah i guess we'll see the bands but you know they'll, they'll stick around for the dance club and i can't relate to it. like when i was a hardcore kid it, it was hard like that's what it was all about everything so i couldn't relate to kids that wanted to go to dance clubs and like hardcore was just like a part-time thing and i also didn't want to be up there i remember talking about it on stage and people looking at me like okay boomer although that wasn't a saying back then but you know what i mean like they were just like what is what is this old guy rambling about but it's just more and more we felt disconnected and hardcore all the reasons that we got into hardcore even like you know i hate to say you can only put so much stock in the internet but reading all the message boards and stuff which i used to do i mean I think a lot of people in bands don't admit it, but of course they look and see what's being said about them. But even the message boards I would read, you know, I just started to be like, these are like the kids I got into hardcore to like set myself apart from. Uh, hardcore is a, to me was always people that didn't fit in with the norm. It just became more and more, not only kids that fit in with the norm, but made fun of people who didn't. I remember going to shows and there was like the goth thing and the Marilyn Manson thing was big, and especially at a lot of smaller towns, those kids would come out to punk shows. You know, and they'd have all that netting that, like, the Marilyn Manson kids wear. And, and the hardcore kids would be in the corner making, you know, with their arms folded, making fun of them. And I'd be like, what are you making fun of? Like, you think you're cool with your bleached flat top and, like, stupid T-shirt on that you paid 50 bucks for? You're supposed to be an outcast. You're not making, you're not going to make fun of other people that are. Times change. You're not the outcast anymore. Now that the models have purple hair and studded belts, you're not rebellious anymore. These are young kids, and this is what's, these are the outcasts for their time. And it certainly wasn't going to happen at our shows that they were going to be made to feel alienated. But all that stuff was taking its toll on us. And we were like, I remember thinking to myself, like, I'm not outgrowing the scene as much as it's outgrowing me. Like, it's changing over. I don't make the rules. The young kids are the ones that keep it going. At this point, the band, some of the guys had kids, and the scene wasn't the focus of our lives anymore. That's usually younger kids. They're the ones that book the shows. I mean, there's always older people that do stuff too, but they're the ones that keep the scene going. And it was just, it was just a real disconnect. I remember being like, I don't want to be this dinosaur on stage talking about stuff that people, they can't relate to. They're not going to like us because as a result, and I don't even care if I don't want them to like us. I don't want people that pick on other kids to, to like my band. So that is that what led to from companionship to competition? Like you said earlier that everything changing around you led to that record being written. So because that's the last record you guys that put was out. Part of it. But that that started a little earlier. That started really that was more like I, I guess that's where it started, though. Again, I come from a time not to sound like, you know, Grandpa Joe here, but when I first got into punk hardcore, it's not like kids like that were everywhere. And it's not like people had bleached hair if they weren't into punk or wore vans or studded belts. You know, now you go to any mall and every kid's wearing vans. Like, they're totally in. Back then, only, like, punks and skaters wore vans or studded belts or bleached their hair. Now it's, like, huge with all kinds of people. But back then, if you saw something that looked like that, it didn't matter if you knew them. You went over and you talked to them because there wasn't a lot of people like that. And now I noticed, like, when we started to write that, you saw people like that, you just kind of sized each other up. Like, who's this guy, you know? And I can remember being guilty of that, too. Like, again, I used to go to every show in New York, so I'd see some guy, like, looking the part and being like, you know what, I'm at every show. I don't remember seeing this guy. 
you know, like I'm going to remember every person I run into at a show. You know, I was guilty of it too. But it just, that brotherhood and sisterhood that was a part, a big part of what drew me in was really, I don't even think to this day it exists anymore. Well, it's like if everything was changing so much, because the things really took a giant flip around 2001 and started to, but the 2002, 2003, 2004, like that's when shit really became Vans Warped Tour big and AP Magazine took over as being like the place to find bands and shit like that. So, you know, you, you guys are in it for a while. Like what, what kept you going? Like, why didn't you stop earlier? At that point, we had our own thing going. We had our, fo- we had a following. You know what I mean? Like we were kind of living in our own world. We were, it's funny because side one dummy had us connected to that. I told you, like they, they kind of didn't know, you know, I don't want to sound like I'm bad talking to them at all. They were huge part of us. I mean, they put out our last two records. They supported us. Again, we had a lot of record labels that have a lot of clout that were trying to sign us. So we went with side one for a reason. I mean, you know, at the time, the guys who ran it, I don't know who runs it now, but at that time, they were great. They were supportive. They would fly all over the country to see us, always make sure we had records to sell and stuff like that. Anything we needed, they took care of. I mean, they were really good to us, but I don't think they knew what to do with a band that thrived in in the DIY part of hardcore. They're a part of, like you said, that glossy magazine end of punk. Yeah. Which exists and is huge, but we don't fit in there. Like I said, when you when your record reviews talk about, you know, you don't have vocal lessons, you're missing the point. I mean, I you know, there's bands that I love with all my heart that had a lot less talent, you know, than any of us did. Like, that's not what it was ever about to me. And again, you're missing the point if you're worried about people having music lessons and stuff like that. That To me, that plays no role. It's about heart and passion, not talent. I took pride in our talent, but that's not what made me like or dislike a band. Yeah, I'm actually, I'm on their website right now. They... I never heard anything bad about those guys, about Side One Dummy. And- no, that, that's why I'm trying to stress. Although I don't think they fully knew how to handle us. It's you know? not coming across at all like you're talking shit at all. I, it, it makes total sense. Like I think what well, sounds like they were fans of you guys and they try to make it work. And I think there was just a difference, you know, because they're – if anyone's like, – you guys are – you guys – you said like you lived in your own world, which makes sense. If you're showing up at a place – it's like a hard yes or no. Someone's going to go to your show because they're going to be diehard fans. They're going to be like, well, no, we're not in, this is, this doesn't sound like taking back Sunday. So we're not going to go to this. Yeah. Like for us, a huge show was three to 500 kids show up. We're like, wow, this is amazing. That's awesome. They're, they want to break us up into playing for thousands of people and not for nothing. But again, I've been around that part of the scene you know, that part got very big, and Kill Your Idols was kind of in the middle of it. There was a period of time where, not to pat myself on the back, but I know this because of all the people we talked to and met through the years, a lot of people in the bigger punk labels that we were picked, we were supposed to be the next it band from New York. You know, people kept telling us, you're going to be the next big thing out of New York. You're going to be... But we saw the writing on the wall, and I hate to say it, but this was the time where punk was changing. The audience they wanted was a bunch of young girls that were going to put up pinups of band. The Kill Your Idols is never going to be that band. I remember reading an article where, actually, no, I think it was in, um, the, it was the Kid Dynamite DVD. It was they they did like a documentary on them, and I remember they were saying they did a this tour with the face to face, like face to face and Alkaline Trio and stuff, and they're like. They're like, you guys need to play like a, a 45 minute set or something. And they're like, and Jason was like, dude, my voice just wasn't built to do that long of a set. And they're like, they were trying to put, like put us in these shows that like there wasn't a match. So that just made me think of like what you're saying right now. There, there's a certain place where like your style of music and your band just fits and it really just stays there. And you can't really break that. It, it, it just becomes either too long or. Like the set is just more dynamic in a in a, a, s- a small amount of time or with a certain a certain style of bands where if you 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 break out of that mold it's it's not got the same like we said before like the same yeah. magic and and even the venues you know again because of the crowd participation aspect of our shows 
playing in giant venues with barricades. And again, look, there were times we did it because we it was just it was the right show. We wanted to play with the bands. The promoter was someone that we knew for years. Whatever the reason, we did take shows like that. But that's not where we were at home. And for a guy that as insecure as me to be up on this giant stage with barricades so no one can even get close to me and like jump all over the place is really intimidating. I don't care how many years we were playing. It's still intimidating to this day. But that's not, we belong in a place where kids can jump up on the stage, where everyone can sing along and be, you know, the, the crowd is part of the show. Well, I mean, that goes back to the beginning where you said the reason you stopped going to dead shows is because there was such a giant disconnect. And so when you are, when you become that band that's on those stages with those barricades, you're thinking back, you're like, I started this to not do this. Exactly. It's a, to me, look, we respect the bands that we played with and toured with. So I wasn't going to get up on stage and be like, man, fuck bands that play with barricades. <laughs> Again, we were older and we had a good understanding. As much as, you know, ideology was a big part of Kill Your Idols, we also made exceptions. You know, we tried to play, for example, we always tried to play all eight shows. When Poison Idea came east, there was one show that was 21 and over. This was a big thing for Kill Your Idols. We had to have a band meeting. Are we going to actually play a show that's 21 and over? We're going to cut out half our fans. So we got in touch with the club, and we made a deal with them. So what they did was they played, they did an, an afternoon show that was all ages, and then a night show that was 21 and over, which to us was acceptable. But we got a lot of shit for it anyway. But this is where people lose themselves in their ideology. We were like, we're not cutting anyone out. We're playing an all ages show so everyone could go. Yeah. If the club is cool enough to do a show, you know, let them do the second show that's so that's you know age restricted. It doesn't matter because anyone under twenty one can come to. You know, it was the same lineup during the day as it was at night, so there shouldn't have been an issue. And that's how we looked at things. We took it again. Curly Idols like took everything we were offered. We waited if it was good for the band, if it was good for the people that supported us, or was going to alienate them or not. So. Again, we played shows with barricades and this and that, but we did it because we felt it was right at the time for whatever reason. I mean, there were times we went on those big tours and we'd play these big clothes and that clubs and then afterwards we'd go play a house show. That's so awesome. So kids that didn't support those clubs could still come and see us. You know, we would ask them, look, don't announce this in advance because promoters would be like, you know, could affect ticket sales. You know, again, you have to... You have to be respectful of your surroundings. Like, if you want to do this for your life, you know, which is what we were doing, you have to be willing to play that game. And when you play some of these bigger clubs, the promoters are like, well, you can't play another local show because kids that want to see you aren't going to get tickets to our show. And that makes sense to us. And it's, look, that's fair enough of a guy that's taking a risk of, you know, offering guarantees and, and putting on shows. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think that's unreasonable to ask. But I met plenty of kids through the years. You're like, fuck that, man. No one's going to tell me what I could do with my band. And it's like, you know, then you'll never get any bigger than playing in a basement. And six people will know about all your hard work. I want that everyone, without breaking my ideals, I wanted everyone I could to be able to hear my lyrics and our music and everything we had to say. So what was the final, I'm sure you probably said this a billion times in interviews, but like, you know, everyone, there's different avenues where maybe someone hasn't read or heard an interview you've done. So, like, what was the the final thing that made you guys disband? Because you just basically just put out your last record and then, actually, no, it was about two years later you, you end the band. But you also had a release at that same time. Something started here, which was a split with... Well, that uh, came like, out at the end. That That's all released stuff. That was okay. like, somebody took a lot of, like stuff that was hard to find, like a lot of the splits that, you know, only came out one pressing and never was recorded again, and early comp tracks. I mean, that's a really cool release also. Like, Gary wrote this whole thing about the history of the band and where we were when we recorded all this stuff. But we actually did a really, it seems to have gotten lost in the mix, but we actually did a 7-inch. Our last release was a 7-inch called Salmon Swim Upstream. I don't think almost anyone knows about it, which sucks because I really like the songs that are on it. But that was actually our our final release. That came out after the last record. Okay, yeah, that's on Discogs, actually. I just saw that. 
There was, I don't think there was one final straw. I think it was like our time has come. We've done everything. We far exceeded our original goals. What else can we possibly do that we haven't done already? Do we really, you know, we started to see bands that were around for as long as us. Nobody was coming to see them anymore. You know, they went from opening band to headliner and they're working their way back to opener because people just don't care. But we didn't want to be that band. You know, we had two, I told you, we never, we took, everyone in Kill Your Idols took this band totally serious. Sometimes we were accused of taking it too serious, but. What do you mean? Out like, of our love for the band, we were not going to let it become like, oh, nobody cares anymore. Like, let's get out. You know what they say, like, get out while you're on top. Leave them wanting more. I mean, we were all in a different places. The guy, uh, you know, some of the guys were getting more into playing other stuff. I think I think at that point, everyone but me was in other bands also. We weren't touring anymore at that point. Again, some of the guys had kids, and we just had to... I mean, oh, I remember at one point, uh, we, we actually tried to look if we could incorporate ourselves so we could try to get some kind of insurance benefit or something, because, you know, you'd come home with some money from tour. I mean, we were never so successful that, like, we had these big bank accounts. It's like I'd come home pay my rent and a couple of my bills and then we broke again till we went back out on the road or if I was lucky enough to have like a job to hold me over till the next time. But, you know, one doctor appointment or one car repair and it was, that's it. You were in the red. I mean, so some of the guys couldn't do that anymore. They had families. So there wasn't one thing where we were like, that's it. It's done. It was, like I said, we felt the scene was kind of outgrowing us. We wanted to go out while we considered we were still, you know, on top of our game. And, uh, you know, again, we, Kill Your Idols wasn't the number one focus in our lives anymore. And we felt like that's where it deserved to be if we were going to do it. Was there like um, a relief at the end or a bit of a, a kind of a shit, what do I do now? No, I, I think at the end there was there was relief. I think that there was... Like I said, on, on, at the time, I didn't know it, but I think there was a lot of animosity building because a lot of stuff that I had put the guys through some of those years. Um, you know, there was just some stuff like that. Plus, you know, again, living in a van. We're not, we weren't kids anymore. So living in a van together, you know, all those months a year, you know, it took its toll on some. You know, that Gary and I didn't speak for, I think, three years after we broke up. And we didn't even really have a falling out. It was just, uh, you know, I think it was just like, just burned out. It was, it was really, really uh, emotional. But like we did a last weekend of shows and it was, I mean, it was, it far exceeded, uh, once again, anything we ever thought it would be. People made like all these homemade shirts and it was the Kill Your Idol skull with like a tear underneath oh, wow. like the eye. Yeah, I mean, people like made all these homemade shirts, and people like I like, saw so on the internet someone was like, "Everyone wear your oldest Kill Your Idol shirt to the show today." Like, you know, again, all the Kill Your Idols family, as we call them, all all were there. People flew in from literally all over the world for the last shows and stuff, and it was it was just it was just crazy. They had like the last show, they had banners and confetti, and like wow, it, it was it was really emotional but at the same time it was it was time it sounds like a fucking party man it sounds amazing oh the story of our last show is just i mean i don't know how much time we have but it, it's a story into itself it got closed down by the fire marshal we had to move it yeah i read this yeah tell that story we got time we were supposed to play on the venue like i said people had come from i mean people flew in from germany england hungary you know, uh, California, oh, oh, Chicago, Florida, all over the place. You know, just it was pretty crowded. And the fire marshal came and shut the show down. But there's way too many people here. I remember there were just cars parked all over the neighborhood. That was it. It was like, well, that's it. This is how things end. And then um, somebody said, hey, we got a practice space in the middle of an industrial park. There's no houses around. Why don't we just like just tell some of like your biggest fans and the people that travel from all over and you know just go play like a, a small show there? So we were like, yeah, whatever. You know, at this time half the band had left. 
we had to track them down and see if they could come back out, you know, come back and play. And then word started to spread. It was like, you know, people whisper, hey, they're going to play. And next thing you know, there's this giant caravan of cars going down the Southern State Parkway heading to this industrial park. It was too big to do inside their little studio. So they moved it to the parking lot outside and they just ran a bunch of cords out there and set up the amps and everything. And we played like, I want to say four songs. People were like diving off the dumpsters and like oh, just going crazy. And then the cops came and shut that down. So we did like four or five last songs and that was it. Oh man. Did you feel like that was, uh, how do I word this? Like, the perfect ending. I mean, granted, they oh, got shut could, down, but you couldn't have written it. No, but it was perfect. That's that's what makes it legendary. The fact that it got shut down, then it got moved, and I, I mean, you should have seen like it was like every car on the parkway was hardcore kids heading to this like <laughs> mystery spot, you know, following each other so they didn't get lost. And then it was too big, so they had to move it outside. And it was just the intensity and the the passion, and then the rush to like set it up before something else happens and you know and then the fact that it did get shut down after a couple of songs it, you know and the cops were cool they didn't give anyone tickets or anything they just said you know this is too crazy you guys gotta like no more no more music they're like this is the coolest shit ever but we legally just for some reason there's a noise violation yeah noise. basically they were like what's going on and someone told them like this band wants to play their last show and people are here from all over the place and you know the cops were cool enough again that they didn't hassle anyone but they were like they were like we were on the other side of town and we couldn't hear the music all we could hear is people it sounded like people chanting they thought there was like a cult <laughs> meeting or something going on because <laughs> i guess the amps were down low and because of the crowd all they could hear is like yelling <laughs> that's so fucking awesome oh my god yeah but i remember being like you couldn't write a better ending like the intensity of the people would be like no it's not ending like this we have to get them to play somewhere you know because people were coming it wasn't just instantly like shut it down oh we can move it here you know there was like 45 minutes of everyone kind of milling around like oh now what well i guess it's not gonna happen like i said some some of the band left some of our fans that i mean the guy Vinny that i told you first introduced gary and me to each other was you know big part of the band. I mean, again, he introduced us. You know, he had already left. He ended up missing the show. He was on his way back home to Brooklyn. Oh, man. And, you know, no one got in touch with him. But the, the intensity of, no, it has to happen. You know, where can we do it? And then finally, you know, again, it wasn't right away. Finally, someone was like, what about our rehearsal space? And, and again, then trying to keep it like a secret and it just leaking out to everyone. And, you know, people were like, I was already home and someone texted me and I got back in my car. It was just... Again, you couldn't write an ending like that. So I'm going to ask a couple questions and then we'll wrap this up. But when you guys got together, because I, you know, again, the thing that I see that was quick was the Hate Five Six video and you guys playing in 2017. Was that the first time you guys got together for a reunion show after 2007 or did anything happen in between then? Oh, no. Dude, go online and look up Clear Idols at Webster Hall. Okay. We got to we got back together in 2013. Okay. To play um, a New York festival called the Black and Blue Bowl. I don't know what happened. I mean, again, the band was not really on good okay. terms necessarily. Some of the members, hey, Gary and me, were speaking again, but some of the guys definitely still had held grudges, and rightfully so. So we really, I didn't know, you know, Gary and me talking, we were like, maybe one day. Just out of the blue, this offer came about, and the guys that we never thought would do it again said, hey, let's do this, you know, like get in touch with Andy and let's do it. Because they were already all in a, another band together. So they said, you know, get in touch with Andy and let's let's do this. You know, and again, at the end, Killiardos had two lineups. Like Vinny and Mike kind of came in and saved the band, but... That's a whole nother story. But so that was the lineup we finished with. The lineup that we ended up playing the reunions with was the lineup from what I consider the heyday of Kill Your Eyes. Like when we were touring nonstop, like we'd get home, put out a release, go back on the road, get home, put out a release, go back on the road, go back on the road, go back on the road, put out a release, go back. That was that lineup. You know, there was a little like, well, I think we should use these guys and we think we should use these guys. So. 
we decided all that pretty quickly, actually. I have the video up. It's it's crazy. So go on the Webster Hall one. Yeah, there were thousands of people. Like I have no idea. Again, I'm being my neurotic self. Do you think anyone cares? Does anyone even remember us? We get there. We go on. You know, again, I don't know what to expect. I see a lot of the old faces, but I don't know if that they're there for us or not. This show, I was definitely not. You know, at this point, I was kind of a a neurotic. You know, totally overridden with anxiety. I didn't know what to expect. I was kind of keeping a low profile. Like, I wasn't my usual self out in the crowd mingling and hanging out with everyone. So I didn't know what to expect. And then before we go on, like, just while they're kind of... We, we had, like, a little music to play while they were kind of setting up their stuff and tuning their instruments and all. And all of a sudden, like, people have banners. Welcome back, kill your idols. Uh, you know, like little, or like more than one, like a bunch of them. And all of a sudden, everybody moves up front. And I mean, you see the size of that crowd. We're talking like, yeah. I mean, I'm bad with numbers, but at least a thousand people. Yeah. Before, as soon as Gary starts with the feedback, the place starts going completely ape shit. A bunch of people dressed up as bananas and Santa Claus come <laughs> diving out from backstage, which was an old inside joke. With Kill Your Idols. Like, that was another thing. Like, people would come in costume to our shows and stuff. But the Bananas and Santa Claus was an old inside joke with us. All of a sudden, they come out of nowhere. And again, people were throwing confetti. And the place just, I mean, exploded. People that had known us for years and never, like, paid attention to us were like, where the fuck did you guys come from? Like, it was just, that was the kind of show that you want people that aren't into hardcore to see. So you can be like, yeah, you know, it's just a little gig. You know, there's thousands of people completely losing their mind. I mean, that that was a show that, you know, bands go a whole lifetime and don't play a show like that. This is the craziest fucking... It's only four minutes. It's the first song. It's from Falling. And so you guys open up Falling. And yeah, it goes... That's one of our biggest sing-along songs. <laughs> it's crazy, dude. Holy shit. And you're going like, no, it's so funny. You're talking about like you had anxiety and I get that behind the stage. It's nerve wracking, but you get out there, man. I mean, you couldn't, eat, you can't tell that because you're just going nuts. Like everyone in the band's going crazy and the whole place is just on fire. Well, another thing, as much as I'm nervous, they're also that nights again where that natural high kicks in and yeah. you're just like, I mean, I was just, how can you be nervous? I mean, between songs, I was nervous because I wasn't talking that much and stuff, but while we were playing, again, I'm totally confident in us. And what I saw in front of us was like, I just couldn't, I just could not believe it. And Gary was like, yo, you got to say something, you know, you got to say something. So I'm just like, what's up, New York? Like, I didn't know what to say. <laughs> and the, the, like you could see on the video, the place just goes. And we played crazy. So we've played bigger crowds. We played like a festival in Germany that had, you know, 30,000 people. We played festivals with thousands of people before but this was like people that all loved us it was a fest they weren't just there for us but when we played like you you didn't want to have to be the band going on after us i don't care how big you were. yeah not that night yeah no i mean everyone was just all the other bands were just they were like man i knew you guys were popular but i didn't know this time you know like it was just i was like i didn't either What's the whole, uh, this, the inside secret with the bananas and the Santa Claus outfit? It's it's just a little Kill Your Idols thing, but we played a show. Again, people used to like come in costume to our shows. Just, again, because they were just goofy kids having fun. We played this show, and there were some locals there. They were like trying to be tough and you know getting in the pit and starting to starting fights with kids. So a bunch of off the inner family, let's say that happened to be dressed up as like, there was a one kid dressed up as a banana and one of Santa Claus. They like beat these kids down, took them out, not beat them down, like stomped their heads in, but stopped them from picking on kids and got them out of there. So the next time we played there, I was just like, oh, the last time we played here, someone got beat up by a banana and Santa Claus. And then ever since then, people just came to our shows dressed as bananas and Santa Claus. Yeah, because the two got the three of them like run up to you like towards the end of the song and like just crowd you and like when you get when you're singing. Yeah, it was just it was just something that I said that was that they. I don't know. It's weird. You would say things without thinking, but the people, you know, I saw all kinds of stuff online of things I would say on stage that people really like, either took to heart or like, 
you know, just it became an inside joke. Like I said, our, 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 our fans that used to come to see us all the time had their own connection to each other that we knew nothing about all the years we were a band. So they would have their own inside jokes that, you know, we didn't even know about. So apparently this bananas and Santa Claus was a big thing. And we didn't even know. We just knew that ever since then kids came dressed up like that. Like, I didn't think it was that funny that I said that it's really not that funny. That's what happened. <laughs> but whatever the case, it became this big thing. It could be, uh, so it's usually if we still play, there'll be someone like a banana or Santa Claus in the crowd, almost definitely. But since then, we played those shows. Then we played the This Is Hardcore Fest in Philly. Yeah. And then we just kind of said, man, people still want to see us. They love us. And then we started, offers started piling in. Um, we used to play this club in Belgium. You know, I told you there were these little hot spots for Philly Idols. Belgium was another one. A small town, Cantique, I think it's called. Again, it was another place. It was like kind of like their version of ABC No Rio. But again, we, every show there was just crazy. And we hung out with all the locals all night. Every time we played there, it was a great club called Lint Fabrique. And they brought us over to Belton. It was like a 10-year anniversary of the club or something. And, you know, they brought us over to play two shows, which was, you know, amazing. The shows were great. It was just great to see everyone over there and stuff. But since then, we... We get offers and we weigh our options. And if it's a good offer, if it bands you want to play with or the time is right or whatever, we take it. And we do that a couple of times a year if we can. I was, I've been starting to ask this lately. Is there any story, like funny story or crazy story from back in the day that you'd like have never talked about that you'd feel like you'd want to tell right now? If I never talked about it, there's a reason. I, <laughs> I mean, we lived in a van for years. There's plenty of stories, but... You know, that old saying, what happens in the van stays in the van. You know, people always say, oh, do you have funny tour stories and stuff? And it's like, no, they were funny to us at the time. You know, I remember driving all night and just like Gary and me in the front, everyone sleeping in the back and just like completely delirious reciting lines from the movie Meatballs over and over. And like to this day, we're still hysterical about it. But to someone else, it would be like that Bananas and Santa Claus. Like, well, what's so funny about that? You know, a lot of the stuff that's funniest to me and Gary and the guys in the band, to, to someone else to be like, uh, I don't get it. You know, that's a really good point because I think you expect this crazy shit to happen. I, I think with bands, you know, back in the Guns N' Roses days, obviously that was there were crazy stories because the shit was just insane. But I think you nailed it. Um, I think a lot of touring was just long drives and then playing and just being bored and then just doing anything to entertain yourself but that was the crazy things to you guys but you're right to anybody else they're like that doesn't sound like an interesting story you're like yeah but to us i mean that's that's all we had so there wasn't this need to go out and create yeah they were those drives were filled with interesting conversation and funny times and practical jokes and us you know helping each other through hard times but if you weren't there it doesn't count and as for touring it's like you nailed it it's like you long drive, you go to the local record store, the vegetarian restaurant, you play the gig, and you you go to sleep, and you go to repeat. Uh, there were times, like in Europe, that I would be miserable, because it's like you got to get to the club really early. The other guys at least have instruments to play with. I'm just like sitting there, especially when I was depressed, I'm sitting there miserable for hours in like these freezing cold castles, you know, having to wait eight hours to play. And I, I do, in hindsight, really regret that. Like, when the band broke up, I was content. But as time started to go on, and I, I reconnected with a lot of my own friends, my friends that I grew up with that weren't into hardcore. And they were like, you know, now Facebook was around, and they saw the band and everything, and they were like, dude, you were in a band that put out records and had fans. Like, I can't even get my wife to come see me, you know, at the local bar. I'm lucky if someone pays attention when I play. You know, a couple of the guys are in bands, but not like this. You know what I mean? They might play some parties. Maybe they'll play a bar and there'll be a couple of people, but not hundreds of kids going nuts, buying your records and singing along and getting your logo tattooed on them. You know what I mean? It's a whole different level. A lot of them were like, and why did you give this up? Like, what possible reason could you have for not doing this anymore? And I'm like, well, it had run its course. And they're like, what are you, stupid? Like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, they couldn't relate to the reasons. 
they were just like, dude, why would you ever stop doing that if people still want to see it? So I, that's when I started to kind of be like, man, they're right. Like, what, what the fuck? Well, I'm depressed in Poland, kicking the van, yelling, I want to go home. Well, I should have enjoyed every minute when I was out there. Like, I, I really regret those times that I gave in to my depression or whatever I was going through and did not love every moment. That's why when we did get back together, I promised myself I'm going to cherish every minute of this band. Every show we play, I'm going to fucking just love it. I don't care. If nobody wants to hear us, then I'll love it with the, just the five of us playing. So did you hold true to that? Yeah, other than that little thing I had when we first started writing again where I wasn't sure of, but by, again, by the time, you know, 10 minutes into it, I was completely back and... Like you said, the magic was there. And other than that, yeah, as far as playing, it was one time I I got a little, look, again, I'm in my 50s, man. Some of these festivals are a lot. To go and sit while well, 18 bands play and you got to wait till 2 in the morning to play your set, it, it, it takes its toll. So, you know, I can remember one of the shows we played since we were back, I was like, man, I don't want to, you know. I would literally would be more happy in my hotel room watching TV right now. That was just one time, and we talked it out, and we agreed, you know, we'll try not to take any of these big fests anymore. Because, again, we also don't want to be that band that shows up and plays. Because we always looked at bands like that when we were a band, like, you know, who the fuck are these guys? They show up just to play. You know, we, we do play some festivals, but I just, like I said, I don't let it get to me anymore. I, I see my friends. Wherever we are, I'm going to have friends that I don't get to see, even if it's just the guys in the band. You know, I don't get to see them that often. So I make the most of it when we play. I mean, all our shows since we got back have been pretty good, except for maybe one or two. And I didn't let it get me down. I still love playing. As soon as we start playing, I just get lost in the music. And I think about, you know, with all my old friends, none of them being hardcore people, they're the ones that really inspired me to like, you know, don't get down. You know, you take it for granted. When you're in this music and you're in a band, you take it for granted. You lose sight of like, Wow, you know, I remember one of my friends was like, you're living a dream of millions and millions of kids. Every young kid wants to be a rock star. You might not be a rock star as far as, you know, limos and lots of money, but you're on stage and you have fans singing along. Like, what more could you want? And I'm like, wow, when you put yeah. it that way. <laughs> yeah, grass is always greener. I mean, when you're in it, you you have to make that choice because there, there are things that are going to bum you out and they're going to burn you out, but you you, you, you have to really well, remind yourself that's what I said. I'm like, that. until you live it, you can't understand it. I, I can't feel guilty for what I did. Yeah, part of that is what made us who we were. You know what I mean? Like everything happened, happened for its own reasons. And that's the way it was. I can't look back. I can only have so much regret. Yes, I wish I didn't allow myself to fall that deep into things, especially while, you know, I'm in the middle of Eastern Europe and wherever we were in the world. But at the same time, it is what it is. And I just won't make that. I won't let that happen again. But as long as we're playing, you know, we got we made an agreement. Like, if people aren't interested, we stop. Or if one of us loses interest, we stop. That's it. Who's the? In, before I ask the last two questions, who's the the current lineup that you guys are sticking with when you play, or like you, yeah, for like recording the new record and when you play out again? Well, it's Gary and I who started the band, and it's been us. You know, every single thing Kill Your Idols has done, it's, uh, it's been me and Gavin. And then um, we have Mike D on bass, who he's one of the guys who came in before our last record when I was feeling really burnt out on writing and stuff. And he helped to save the band at the end, you know, get a few more years out of us. This guy Hugo plays second guitar. Again, he's, he's someone that was just part of the family. We met him when he was a little kid. You know, he was a huge Kill Your Idols fan. He, he was one of the guys who was dressed up as a banana. You know, he was just he was just the guy that came to see us for years, you know. And as he grew up, he was in other bands and stuff like that. And eventually we decided to get a second guitarist again. And we asked him just because he's just a cool guy and he's always been around. On drums, we have our friend Anthony. He's another one. He's a kid. He's been coming to see us since he's like 12 years old. I mean, he was a little kid when he first started coming to see us. Now he's in like Shia Terra and a bunch of other bands. And, you know, we again, we consider them part of the family. You know, he's been around since he's been coming to our shows. He goes and sees Kill Your Idols every time we play. 
You know, he's one of those guys who knew all our songs. We didn't have to tell him what to learn, you know, him and Hugo both. But it's kind of a sad story how we got him. You know, I should mention that last year we did lose our old drummer, Vinny, um, who was next to Gary. Vinny and me were probably closest. And uh, he passed away last year. And, uh, you know, really was like, are we going to do this without him? Because originally we were like, if any one of us leaves, it's done. Like, this is the lineup and that's it. But uh, I guess due to what happened, we decided that we would continue because we feel like that's kind of what he would have wanted. But it was horrible. And, I mean, Vinny was, uh, he came, him and Mike D came at the same time. And they, they breathed life into the band when it was really burnt out. Like, that last record is... Uh, a lot of the, I was so burnt on writing, I would just write down what I wanted to say. Like I'd write out a paragraph of like how I was feeling, and Vinny would take it and turn it into a song. He would make it so it flowed and so it rhymed and everything like that. So a big part of that record from companionship to, to competition was written like that. Like I'd be like, you know, this is how I feel about this, and he would turn it into a song. But he was, uh, and he was a great guy. That's a bummer. Yeah, I mean... It is a big bummer. And you know what? It's like, I'm not going anywhere with this. I just I just felt like I should mention him because... Yeah, absolutely. You know, he's just someone I love dearly. And it's it's it sucks that he's not around. And he, he would be, if he was still with us today, he would still be a member. That's no disrespect to Anthony. You know, Vinny just... He, he was in it for the long haul. We weighed our options. And we're like, is it right to... Con- Continue when something like this tragic happens like are people going to turn on us is it do we feel right about it but we thought about it and we thought about knowing Vinny the way we did we thought about what he how he would feel too you know yeah he would I mean he Vinny loved this band I hate to, I hate to end such a good interview on a bummer no I man I think it's I think it's justified for you to you know not justified I think it's good for you to to mention them, you know, I think, uh, you know, it's right. Yeah, yeah. It, like I said, there, I was there was no way to go with it, but I just felt that I had. I mean, for me, like the segue from that to me going like, "What do you want to plug?" It's kind of like it seems so yeah, so exactly. bleak, but that's always the end of these two questions. So, like, I just have no soft way to transition to that. Well, we're gonna, like I said, we just recorded our first few songs. It's gonna be out on a split. It's so the band is called Rule Them All, and it's on Flat Spot Records. And that's going to be a split EP. In the, like I said, it's our first two new songs. And if you like Kill Your Idols, there's nothing to not like about these songs. You'll love them. Is this going to be on vinyl at all, or just going to be on um, streaming? You know, that's a good question. It better be on vinyl. One thing we've had in every contract Kill Your Idols has ever done, we made sure that our releases were coming out on vinyl. So... You know, it's funny, I haven't actually talked about the details with Gary, but I have to assume that he would make sure that it's going to be on vinyl. I love how you go, you're like, I don't know, but it better be on vinyl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I'm not even like a collector anymore, but I just, you know, there are tons of collectors out there, so. And I appreciate it, I used to be. I just always feel like punk and records, you know, like when the record industry died, punk still kept it. You know, it was, now vinyl's coming back, but... It was just always the thing, and I just, I still, I, I still, you know, I've sold my collection three times over, but I still have about four hundred records that made the cut that I still listen to. Oh wow, yeah, I've been getting into vinyl a lot recently. I went from zero, I had just a bunch of seven inches from back in the day, to I think I've got maybe, I don't know, like fifty or sixty records in the last three years. Just keep buying them. I mean, giant dent in your wallet, but it's totally worth it. It's crazy how expensive they are. I remember I used to mail away for seven inches for three bucks. I remember the first time I saw them at seven inches for five bucks. I was like, what? <laughs> this is an outrage. Just like when I fell when Grateful Dead tickets went up to 30 bucks. But times change. And I remember, you know, when we used to tour, kids would get mad at us. Oh, how can you play a show for 12 bucks? It's like, dude, we got to put gas in our, in our tank. Like everything can't live on punk ethics. You can't have five bands for five bucks and still have the bands get paid and put gas in their vehicles and eat a meal, you know, like all things are relative. You got to keep up with the world. 
so that's a really funny segue in the last question that I ask everybody. So it's what I always end with. Um, so what punk rock ethics do you hold on to to this day? Or what scene ethics, I would say. What scene ethics do you hold on to this day? It's like the same thing. Well, I think one thing is I still try to support the little guy, you know, like as far as like even stores, like if I have a choice to go to a big chain store or a small independent, you know, like pharmacy or whatever you want to talk about, hardware stores, I try to go to like the independently owned one. And I think that's something that I got from hardcore and it might not be scene oriented this, but I feel like just the person I am, like I don't take anything at face value. I question everything, you know, every, especially this year with the pandemic and the, now the vaccine and, you know, so many people on both sides of things. And, you know, I, I really, I don't take anything at face value anymore. And if, if I care enough about it, I'll research to get to an answer that I feel I believe in. And if I don't, then I just shrug my shoulders and say, well, who cares anyway? But, you know, as far as, you know, the scene itself, you know, again, it's, it's, it's just really made me who I am today. I just think the way I look at life and everything else, you know, I, I don't know that I could pinpoint it, but it's just, it's embedded in me and it's who I am.